the charge carriers, a separation of the charge carriers and the collection of the charge carriers. If you master on that one, you can make the solar cells. Secondly, the PV technology, you can see the market shares. So here, the crystalline silicon, the blue one is the monocrystalline one and the yellow one is the multi-crystalline. So we have both mono and multi. So both crystalline silicon having the uh, percentage around 95% of market share. Why it is that? Because the silicon material is very abundant in the, uh, in the earth, right? And also very cheap to process it. Secondly, uh, it can be scale up. When you make the solar cell module, the cost is very low. So hence, you can scale up the same thing. Second is the reliability and efficiency is very good, right? So other than that, we have the thin film modules as well. Uh, you can see the per, uh, percentage share is very low because of their efficiency and the stability in the outside world. So you can see the crystalline silicon technology and the supply chain is that. So we used to get the polysilicon material that we have processed through the Chololaski process and we make an ingot out of it. From the ingot, we used to cut it in the very small slices like uh, that ranges from 120 micrometer to 160 micrometer. Uh, range the thin uh, the thin wafer size is there. From wafers, we used to make the solar cell process. The solar cell making process is also very huge, and uh, uh, it requires uh, several uh, different vapor deposition method. Then I uh, will cover it in a brief introduction. And then from these cells, you connect in series all these small small cells together and make the full module. So uh, also you will see the learning curve of the PV models. That curve we call the lifeline of the PV technology. Why it is that you can see how the price per watt is going down and down. That's why the people are getting uh, this crystalline silicon model to install the, with their solars uh, inside the like field or uh, on your rooftop because the price is getting lower and lower. So the limit is around 0.1 dollar per watt peak. So this is the graph that every solar scientist that you have to show that how much the price is going down. If this is going down, that, that means you are doing well and the industry is also utilizing your capability of uh, investing in the new technology and how this price is going down by accepting that new technology in your line. Okay. The cost of PV electricity, we call it the levelized cost of electricity which is the ratio of the lifetime cost of the whole plant versus the total energy generated in the lifetime. So you can see in the time of VF, like the moment you install your PV panels in the rooftop somewhere else, and you compare with your grid electricity versus solar electricity, how much time it will take to get the profit, uh, uh, like get the rid of all the capital that you put initially, and then the cost will be like zero. So you have to pay a very zero cost for this, uh, all your electricity bills. So that's why like we call it the uh, cost of PV electricity LCOE and the cost competitiveness compared to grid electricity and PV electricity is huge. So coming to the R&D uh, thrust area in solar PV. So we divide in the quadrant format where we have to focus on efficiency and the cost. If the cost is super high, no one can afford it. If cost is low and is not that efficient and not reliable, then no one will buy. So that's why we have to find some way such that the efficiency is also good, cost is also okay. At the same time, the energy yield is higher and the reliability for the longer duration the solar model can sustain. So this kind of curve that we have to look around. So for that one, to increase the model efficiency, we used to use higher efficiency solar cells. So there are different kind of solar cells. We call it a like state of our solar cell that I will cover in the next slide. Secondly, the cost reduction that how you can perform using the new module design, which can use like less amount of silver material, glass and fabrication process such that it can result in the higher throughput. So more and more modules can be made like uh, within a short period of time. Improving the reliability energy yield in the outdoor is also one of the considerations. So you can see there are several ways you can just play around and make the uh, high efficiency, high reliability, high energy yield, and very cost effective modules. Okay, so now I will cover the state of the art crystalline silicon solar cells. 
So why we call it the uh, state of the art is like new technology which is coming in the picture. Right now in India, uh, the thing is that we have just started the park. Still, we are having the multi crystalline. Hello, hello, Deepankar here. Uh, there is a there is a uh, button in the bottom. There is a screen on the screen. There is a square box coming in your on your screen. You oh, just sorry, press. Sorry. Yeah, yeah sure, sure. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's okay. Yeah. Thank you. So. Um, you can see in the state of the art question silicon, the perk one is a passivated emitter rear contact the emitter part like uh, we make a junction like you uh, shine the light and you create an electron hole pair now this electron hole pair need to be separated so the separation can be done by injecting one of the uh, uh, junction which is called the pn junction so the N type of uh, material, which is called the N plus emitter, it is passive. It is said that the lower loss will be there while uh, transporting the uh, um, uh, electron from the base to the contact side. So we call it the perk. And you can see the perk market in the world is quite higher, right? Uh, especially on 2022. Okay. Now, uh, secondly, that if you see for the future one, the pup uh, is getting down and overcome by the top cone and silicon heterojunction that I will cover. Why it is that one, I will tell you. So currently, uh, the market is having more than 85% of the pup cells. So wherever you go, the top cone uh, and the pup, uh, including the Adani, Wari, Renew, all people are in India, in India market, they are uh, actually making this kind of PV modules right now. And the VOC is around like 680 millivolt. Right? That is like, uh, is good compared to the moment when in uh, 2015 I was doing my PhD. That time the VOC is, was around like uh, 635 or 640 millivolt. But now it's increased because of the new technology which is coming in the picture. So second one is the top con. Top con is like, it, it is having like a, a tunnel oxide passivated uh, contact. So what is having like uh, we are having a very thin layer such that uh, uh, we can easily transport our electron without having much resistance. So only thing is that how you are increasing your efficiency of the solar cell by reducing the resistance on its cross path. So how we are uh, reducing this uh, resistance losses by including extra diffusion junctions and like uh, uh, transparent thin film layers. On it, so this all require like different different uh, deposition process. We call it like a PCBD, like a plasma enhanced uh, chemical vapor deposition that we used to do, and uh, which resulted in the reduced recombination losses near the metal contact. It's like top side also you can see, and the bottom side also you can see the uh, contacts. Okay, and uh, uh, the advantage of this one is that um, you have to just add uh, additional fabrication equipment on your perk line, like we have a production line. Currently in Adani, we have four gigawatt of production line. In each line that uh, we are having a perk, then we make a top con, just adding one equipment just to do one extra diffusion process that can be converted into a top con. So it is like very easy to adopt for the industry as well. So most of the industries are slowly going for this top con. In India, only Adani is doing this top con one. However, for the Reliance, they're directly going for the heterojunction technology. But the heterojunction technology is required totally different production line. You cannot convert into the, uh, like, you can, cannot upgrade from the your perk line. So I will show you the next uh, heterojunction technology one. In that one, you can see there is an excellent passivation of the amorphous silicon and intrinsic layer. That extra deposition process from the both side is required and having the low temperature process. However, the top cone is having like 70, uh, 750 degrees Celsius to 800 degrees Celsius just to uh, push a contact, uh, make a contact on the solar cells. However, this is a low temperature one. So this one is required a, a different low temperature adhesive to uh, make a contact of the uh, uh, copper and tin combinated uh, this, uh, ribbons, right? So second thing is, is that uh, it is having a higher VOC. I'm telling you this uh, VOC is around 700 to 735 volt is range. Depends on like uh, how much the 
maximum efficiency that you can get from it. However, this uh, kind of uh, uh, solar cell is having a higher efficiency compared to the top corn one. However, if you com com compare their energy generation is almost like nearby range and also like the reliability is also one of the issue because the heterojunction ones they have the uh, 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 in the reliability issue they have a, a one kind of a PID and a LETID. So PID the potential induced kind of degradation that kind of uh, um, uh, degradation that you have to observe. Second is the LTL, light elevated uh, um, temperature induced degradation, right? So that thing is there in the hetero junction, but uh, top cone is better. Still, that can perform well with a lower cost. And the hetero junction is also is very good in performing, but the cost is higher because the new production line, new equipment, and uh, the cost will go high. So if you can see the market scenario, like uh, how the puck cells are doing and, current, uh, and compared to the passivated contact uh, uh, N-type and uh, P-type monosilicon. So you also be seeing this uh, N-type and P-type material. So the base we are using, sometimes we use the puck for P-type and with the top cone, we're using N-type. Why it is that? Because the N-type material, the mobility of electron is higher than the mobility of the hole, right? So more faster the electron will move out. So that's why the N-type material is giving you the more efficiency compared to the P-type of material over the period of time. Okay. Um, so you can see the uh, this uh, passivated quantity, especially the top con one, will dominate the market from uh, 2030 onwards. That you can see. However, the perk mark, uh, sorry, the perk will go down slowly, and the adaptability rate or the top cone will increase soon because of the lower uh, upgradation charges. Third one is the all back contact cells that no one is doing in India right now. Why? Because the process for this one is totally different and it is like much higher cost compared to the heterojunction technology. So what is this in the um, uh, all back contact is that all the contacts which are in the front side is shifted into the rear side. So the front side is totally open for the, all the sunlight. So more sunlight will become, more uh, electron hole pair will generate it, more electricity you will produce from it. So efficiency is super good, right? Very high lifetime wafer required uh, for this one. This is one of the things that uh, uh, minimum requirement for this kind of technology. And uh, <clears throat> having the higher packing density compared to like all other uh, kind of uh, uh, um, um, uh, solar cells, uh, uh, the state of the art solar cells. And this one, uh, of, uh, the contact technology is also different. Like we call it the metal wrap through and like emitter wrap through, like behind everything is totally different. So uh, different, different processes are involved, especially on the back contact solar cells. So the making uh, the production charges, especially for like more than 1.5 or 2 gigawatt line you want to make, it will be super huge compared to the heterojunction one. So people wanted to go for top one first because they already have the perk line. Then uh, if you have, uh, uh, if you want to invest on the more new technology with the lesser cost, like, but more than the top one one, then the people are going for the uh, heterojunction, which is like uh, Reliance is doing. The top one, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the all back contact one, no one is there in India, but uh, all back contact has been pioneered by the Sun Power, which is the US based company right now. So you can see there the module efficiency is super high that I will cover in the next slide. So uh, what are the new technologies other than that that will come is like uh, we call it the tandem technology. Tandem is like uh, having a two or three different band gap of materials like silicon is having like 1.25 electron volt around it. And uh, other than that, we use the thin film like a perovskite material kind of thing, which can having the band gap of around like 1.7 to 1.9 electron volt. So what this band gap is doing, like for this band gap, like you know the solar potential is super huge, like uh, we visible range, we only see like, okay, around 300 to 700, we can see, uh, other than that, we cannot see our eyes are not able to catch up that part. But the, uh, however, the different material can absorb this light. So what we can do is that like we can put two different band gap materials together, make it like two terminal, three terminal, and four terminal devices. And this one will result in the huge uh, energy generation. Like 
first part will uh, capture the other section of the light and second part with the lower band gap initially like for the tandem we use the silicon material and in silicon we use the heterojunction material so that uh, more and more light can be generated out of it the first one is the perovskite the so perovskite versus silicon uh, uh, solar cell we call this like a perovskite silicon tandem modules okay um so coming to the efficiency trend that you can see right now, uh, uh, currently the all back contact cells are having the higher efficiency compared to the heterojunction top cone and all, and which is reaching around like a 25 to 26%. However, if you talk about this tandem one, the tandem one is currently the research is still ongoing and the tandem module which is coming out in like a, in the range of like next two to three years, you will have the huge potential of the uh, 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 higher power modules that will come out of it. So tandem that you can see the efficiency curve is super high compared to any other crystalline silicon uh, solar cells. So we have a very high score, especially all the scientists have the very high score from the tandem one. So if this happens, the people will not go for the park top con and all, like especially the developed country because they have a huge money to invest. So they will go for the tandem one because work for very small area that you can uh, uh, you can generate more energy. Like from two panels of the tandem module, you can generate more energy compared to like putting 16 or 17 of crystalline silicon modules together. Okay. So uh, you can see that uh, in uh, 2031, uh, the tandem efficiency will be around like two, uh, 28 percent. Like uh, that will come in the next uh, two to three years in the lab side. Then they have to check the reliability and energy in the outdoor uh, condition. After a certain in standard test, then only they can be go for the field operation. Also, you can refer to this uh, silicon solar cell efficiency chart. Uh, uh, you can see here like a uh, different crystalline silicon modules are there, which is in the blue in color. And uh, the efficiency is around like 27.6%, especially for the our uh, uh, silicon heterojunction structure, which will HIT or HJT is the same thing. And uh, for uh, uh, tandem one, you will slowly see the curve which will be increasing in the upcoming year. So this is the range till 2023 that we have in the lab reported higher efficiency solar cells in the lab. Second is the how the modules can be made from the solar cell. The now your studies about the all the solar cell different kind of solar cells and uh, how we make the modules out of it. So what we can do is that like all the solar cell we connect in the series pattern and each series pattern like the front contact of the solar cell is connected to the rear contact of the next solar cells and we bind it including the encapsulant material eva glycine and vinyl acetate uh, the front cover and the rear cover is the glass material such that the more and more light can pass it through it so this glass cover is also like a tempered glass floating glass and sometimes the, we use the coated glass so that more light can come inside but not uh, the reflected light from the glass cannot reflect it back, like total internal reflection uh, uh, layer that we had to coat on the top of the solar, uh, top of the glass as well. So that kind of uh, technology, uh, including this uh, 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 different uh, glass structure and uh, different solar cells, so whole uh, like complete energy it will be higher in terms of the module side. However, there are different kind of kind of losses will come in the picture that I will cover soon. Um, so now you know like how we make the modules out of it. Then you have to go through this. The moment you cover like a, a front glass, rear glass, junction box, everything go for the uh, not the junction box. Junction box will come after the uh, lamination process. After lamination process, all the glass and capsule will be stick together. You cannot take it out. Otherwise, you have to just break the module. Then only you can take it out. Then at the last, we cover the uh, make the junction from the terminals such that you can just connect in the field and play around. So second is thing is that state of the art uh, crystalline silicon PV modules that um, how we can make more and more reliable modules out of it. So one of the technology is like uh, putting a more bus bars. The more bus bars, bus bars is like more contacts all over the year. But also there is a 
uh, chances of reflection. The more uh, front side content you put, more reflection will be there, right? So what we can do, we can optimize it by using like reducing the finger length and also like putting a more ribbons with a small size. Second is that, uh, so currently uh, for our uh, top corn material and for perk, we are using five bus part technology, which is like optimum one right now. If you put more six or seven, the losses will be there. Like the, especially the optical losses will be there. Optical lo losses include the ref reflection from the front side, reflection from the ribbon as well. Okay. Uh, and the second technology, we call it half cut technology. Half cut technology is that you cut your full solar cells in two half, like first half and second half, and you uh, make it as a series connection. What is the advantage of having? Because both light are having the same area and you're putting it differently. But what is happening like uh, the the moment you keep the uh, you cut the solar cell in two half the amount of uh, current which is flowing through it will become half what is happening like uh, half of the current is flowing through the ribbon okay ribbon is made up of like copper and tea okay and is having the resistance if uh, full current is flowing through the ribbon in the full cell compared to the half of the cell you see the I square hour losses will be reduced in the half cut cell. So if you make a half cut cell, you can see the relative power gain for the half cut versus the full cells is huge. That's why like you can increase your uh, production by at least 10 to 15 watt in co compared to the like full cell technology to half cut cell technology. Okay. The state of the art uh, crystalline silicon, you can see uh, right now in 2023 uh, uh, nearby, most of the people are adopting this half cut technology. So what is happening like for our perk and for top con, we are using this half cut cell such that we have more power uh, in terms of the module power, right? And other one is the third cell and quarter cell that you are cutting more and more cells in a very, very small part, but also like you are placing the context on it. So the context is like optimized anyway. So you cannot cut more than like six or seven or something like that. Still you can produce a power, but it will be very less compared to like half and third, uh, like a, a third cells, like a three parts uh, of a one single solar cells. Now we are coming to this uh, different kind of context that we are putting. We use like a um, copper tin coated uh, context, which is the ribbon one. So ribbon is like very flat ribbon you can see from here. So how the light is shining, like if you focus on the ribbon part only, so you can see most of the light which is coming perpendicular to it, it can directly go back. Uh, there is a re reflection loss. We call it the optical loss out of it. But if you put a wire like the, you make a ribbon in two different form, like small, small wires, the only very few portion of the light will be reflected. That means still there will be a losses. However, uh, uh, the other lights which is coming on, on it will be internally reflected back to the cell. That means more and more light will be trapped inside. So hence the energy generation will increase. So that's why the wired technology, at least you need like nine to 12 wires for that one. So uh, what people are doing that uh, uh, we are using different, different size of solar cells. Uh, like I have one slide separately other than this presentation. So I will show you in that part as well. Uh, uh, coming to this uh, different cut technology. So you can see like a fibers bar, uh, six bus bar and shingle cells. So shingle cell technology is like a very, very small uh, section of the modules which are connected uh, in a stack, like uh, you can say like in series and you can put on the like, you're not putting the bus bars, I'm telling you. You're putting the ribbons in the wired shape so that the more and more light can be trapped and you can reduce the optical losses. So higher efficiency will be there for the shingle cells. Only problem is the reliability and especially the hotspot issue. Um, reliability means like how long that module can sustain for the various kind of environment, like very harsh environment where the module is operating in the range of minus 60, uh, 65 degrees Celsius to 80 degrees Celsius, especially on the Gulf countries. And in Rajasthan cluster, I saw around 65 to 70 degrees Celsius during the period of May and June. 
Okay, in that particular uh, period, if you are operating in this kind of shingle solar cell, the huge uh, degradation will be come in the picture, especially the hotspots. Uh, now coming to the double glass. So instead of like uh, monofacial uh, cells, we are using a double like both side glass. Initially, what we use the front side glass and the back sheet material, right? The back sheet material is like the polymer. And now we are using glass glass material such that if your uh, solar cell is bifacial, not the monofacial, bifacial means both side the light can trap. How the both side light is coming, that is one of the questions. So what is happening uh, is that you uh, your bifacial solar cell will have the direct light coming on the front side. However, the reflected light from the ground, we call it diffuse light, will again come into the picture uh, from the back side of the model. So we wanted to capture that part as well. So we make the uh, glass glass module. If you make the glass uh, back sheet module, the back sheet will uh, prohibit the diffused light. However, the glass will allow them to again come inside the solar cell. So more and more energy can be captured uh, in terms of the like uh, glass glass bifacial PV module. However, uh, like challenges is there like, uh, more optical loss will be there because the front side light is coming and there is a gap between the two solar cells. So from there, the losses will be there. Also, uh, the lack of the indoor measurements are also there like, and also the energy yield estimation is very difficult. Like it will depend, like if you put on the rooftop, there is no use of the bifacial, better to go for the monofacial only. And uh, the cost is super high and also very heavy to handle in, say, in, the, in the field side as well. But for the, field very uh, large area field if you are installing this bifacial then it's useful now and this technology is useful for only only for the field side operation and not good for the rooftop operation the world share, world market share you can see for the bifacial one uh, you can see like it's slowly increasing especially under the a very uh, like only for the field side not the rooftop one because more and more energy can be yield and you can generate more power and from that you can earn more money from it and compared to the monofacial so monofacial is slowly going down and down and down uh, coming to the pv deployment part you can see like the china has the huge deployment uh, compared to the european union then usa japan and india so right now we have the potential that we can go ahead. We have the new uh, target uh, uh, around like 300 gigawatt by 2030. And Adani is uh, uh, thinking of at least capturing at least 10% of the market, which is around like uh, uh, 30 gigawatt only on solar. I'm not talking about the wind and all. So only about the solar. So you can see the PV deployment for the India is having at least 6% of the global deployment compared to the uh, world total installed capacity. So correct, uh, coming to the Indian part that uh, we have the total renewable powers, including the wind is around 133.9 gigawatt currently right now in 2023 December report that we came. And out of it, like a hydro is small, nuclear is small, and the thermal is always always a backup because only daytime we can run the solar uh, solar modules and the solar fields, but the nighttime we don't have anything. So we have something in the backup. So thermal is always higher. So now the what is the uh, current uh, portion of the renewables is 31% compared to the total installed capacity right now. And India is going forward to make it like at least minimum 40% by end of 2030. So the new target is like 2030 is 500 gigawatt for including all renewables, which uh, covers the solar and wind. So 200 gigawatt for the wind and 300 gigawatt for the solar. So Adani is doing for both purpose, like uh, it is having the solar as well as the wind farms. So Adani is planning for 2030, minimum 45 gigawatt will be there for from the Adani side. And uh, coming, talking about this uh, solar PV installation in India, you can see that there is a like rooftop of around eight gigawatt, but the mostly on the field side and the ground mounted one is 51.8 gigawatts total. And off, off, uh, off grid uh, so like solar, which is like, you can see in the undermand, they have a very big solar farm where they can just generate the energy and consume in the daytime. 
and uh, night time uh, they don't have anything so they use sometimes the diesel generator or like some other kind of grid electricity part but uh, uh, you can find this off grid segment in the uh, andaman one and mostly in the uh, our uh, uh, northern and uh, southern part uh, we have the ground mounted 51.8 gigawatt so total 63 gigawatt that we have right now and we are planning to achieve by 2030s minimum 300 gigawatt and we are going uh, for that one in very good speed i would say <laughs> so coming to the manufacturing part like how many uh, players are there in the uh, market so you can see uh, we are hardly making any sales you know why uh, you will see in the next slide what is happening that china is making a module you see the percentage of the module that china is making 61% but he is making 73% of the global market the cells where, where these the extra cells are going back so these extra cells are lacking uh, getting bought by these companies and they are using these cells connected in series making the lamination process making the whole model so you can see the cell production uh, capacity is low however the model cap production capacity is higher because they are uh, uh, buying the cells from the outside and making because that is the cheaper process compared to doing uh, all the fabrication process that you are in so that's why the china is dominating in that part because they have the all the uh, uh, like uh, raw materials that uh, is required for our model uh, especially for the cell fabrication as well so uh, currently uh, we have this uh, capacity for around like 15 uh, 15 gigawatt uh, 15 to 20 gigawatt for the module ca capacity but we are not fully utilizing it right now but uh, by 2026 20, or 2028 uh, our pli pli scheme is there from the government of india is giving you the incentives to put a more and more uh, self fabrication unit to make it module right so self fabrication so like we wanted to be a more uh, independent from any other country uh, for any raw materials so you can see like we have a 20 gigawatt of manufacturing capacity but hardly we are using around 10 gigawatt not that one but uh, if uh, for our uh, annual production we need at least 30 gigawatt that will come in the year of like 2030 um, based on the uh, uh statistics that we have other than that you can see like wari adani vikram solar goldie renuses uh, premier energy starter solar so that those people are making the cells and the modules okay and these are the like a production capacity of the china compared to like uh, rest of the countries and uh, even in the malaysia that the uh, that the company have we call it the jinko solar the Jinko Solar is owned by like uh, owned by the Chinese guy only. So these people are spending their business in different different countries. So country is producing them like uh, that production will come from the country only. So you see like um, the market is always dominated by the China only until they have the um, raw materials that they're in. Second thing is the, the PV installation versus the manufacturing in India. So we have very less uh, like. Uh, manufacturing unit but we import a lot you can see like the import rate is quite high and the import from china is higher because of the raw material like all the polymers eva bag sheet glass everything we want from china only we don't have a production unit. so uh, in terms of the pv manufacturing part the uh, back surface field the aluminium back surface bsf is almost going down like no one is using that part right now the mono that we are using and the end type mono is coming into the picture. So like uh, the your pug set, pug is like mono and uh, top corn, end type top corn will be like end type materials will be there. Uh, coming to the uh, technology share, you can see like uh, we have the model capacity in terms of Adani having 3.5. Currently we are having a four gigawatt and vikram solar is having around 2.5 then followed by the wari satvik renuses jackson soba pixan goldie solar set so we have these players you can see like in india that they are currently producing the modules uh, now you can see the highest uh, efficient module in the world 
which is coming from the IBC. We, we call interdigited back contact or all, all back contact. So it is IBC and ABC are the same uh, technology. So uh, the rate of, uh, I'm sorry, the efficiency is quite higher for this one. And this is owned by the Sun Power, followed by the uh, uh, high performance back contact cells and then the heterojunction part. After heterojunction, you will see the top core material is coming around 22.3%. Thank you for uh, your attention and these are the all my slides. Uh, I just wanted to cover one of these slides for you. So if I have time, sir, is it okay? Just one slide only. So these are the solar cells and module sizes are there. You can see like uh, the first time where, when it enrolled, like 156 by 156 uh, mm square one, but uh, as the technology grows, the sizes started growing. We call it like M, uh, M, M2 wafers, starting from M2, M4, M6, M12. So the biggest one is like 210 by 210, like M12 wafers. And uh, hence, the module capacity of uh, holding this kind of uh, PV cells and the power will increase like drastically. You can see start from the first M2 wafer. It is around like 300 watt. Now you are reaching along 680 watt peak. So see the huge difference by like uh, adopting this big size of solar cell and, and also like the big size of solar cell comes with different kind of advantages that you have to look around. So that's why like the people started going to the half cut and putting more and more cells in the single package so the more energy efficient and more power uh, model can be produced. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, team. Any questions? I think I have. Uh, Thank you so much, sir, for such an insightful talk. Now we quickly take the queries from the participants. Our first question is Kevin has asked, sir, which one production method is more stable, top on or heterojunction? Okay, so in terms of the stability, both are stable, no problem. Only thing is that which one you want to adopt. Suppose you have more money to start a new technology, then go for the heterogeneous. That the Reliance is doing directly. Reliance is not uh, planning to capture the market in 20, uh, 26 or 28, in 2028. He's planning to capture the market after 2030, right? When the top cone will be higher one and the heterojunction will be higher one, both are having the higher power. At that time, which one will be the more uh, like uh, adoptable? The price for the heterojunction is higher because of the more and more equipments are required, new equipments other than the perk line. But for the top con, you need only one equipment and you can just make a perk line. So making a perk line is also very uh, like require very less capital. Only with like only uh, you can say like uh, 300 to 400 crore if you put, you can make two lines from the perk one. However, to make a top con one, you have just in uh, add additional like uh, around 100 crore for the making two different equipments put in the place and you can revert, uh, recover this cost within next one year, two years. But for the hydro junction one, you have to put a huge, huge means like around 4000 crores. Why? The Reliance, what it did, he didn't uh, go for the very starting like the from scratch, they are doing the hydro junction and model. No, first they bought the REC, Renewable Energy Corporation company, which is Norway based company having the branch in Singapore. They are producing the hydrojunction modules. So they bought that company. This company is making hydrojunction uh, technology modules. They are making this from, uh, they are taking this technology to India in the Jamnagar plant and they are making a production line right now. The production line is not active right now, but they are making it. So hopefully by 2025, you will have the first heterojunction module made in India. So to bring a new technology uh, by the private company is very good thing for the India. But the thing is that you have to take a risk. Who is taking a risk? Like, so both people are taking a risk, Adani and the Reliance both way. So it's the one like, uh, like um, suppose if he, uh, I wanted to answer the stability part, both are stable, both are very good in the terms of the reliability and, all, and also in terms of the energy yield that we have seen the quadrant curve, right? Only the cost part, the cost part having the difference. If you are like, um, I wanted to adopt for the new energy with the less cost, I will go for top one that Adani is providing. 
but if i have the money and i wanted to have more and more power little bit more power from the top you will get i have the money i don't worry about the money then i will go for the heterojunction one so stability wise both are good hope i answer your question yes sir next question is from suman he is asking that how it is different from perboxide solar cells in working principle and is there any effect of surface passivation coating on the performance of solar cell uh yes the uh, actually uh, perovskite cells are not in my domain but uh, i have little bit knowledge about that one but my domain was in crystalline silicon one because i did my phd on that part only the tandem one came after my phd finished so uh, what i am telling is that the perovskite cell is the higher band gap material right higher band gap material that means is uh, able to absorb all the energy which is coming from less than 300 uh, um, nanometer wavelength light right but uh, uh, this other light which is uh, invisible range the uh, crystalline silicon material is taking out of it so using this two part together we can make it like a sandwich structure and make a more higher power module we call it a tandem module but suppose you are talking only about the perovskite solar cells and modules the especially uh, the very big issue is the reliability or any way is the thin film you can put anywhere and just run on it like uh, the thin film uh, solar cells if you talk about you remember like uh, during uh, like uh, uh, before 2010 or 2020 12 we used to use the calculator which is having a very small bagni color kind of uh, solar cells on top of it and we used to run out the calculator part right that is the thin film one so we used to use that part but you remember like uh, how uh, long that particular cell is working no idea like uh, the reliability is very low you can put a money for 5 uh, years you can run it and then you can put it out but you see like uh, you put your calculator that calculator for a day or two outside of the uh, outdoor condition that will have some small small uh, dark spots will be there what is the dark spot is that the inactive area on the cell that is that area will not generate the electron hole pair so that reliability issue will come so that's why people are going to adopt the crystalline silicon which is having a more reliability more energy yield compared to the perovskite one that's why the people are not going for the perovskite for the large field we are going for the large field uh, like uh, in a, for the power generation we are going only with the either with the crystalline silicon or or either with the amorphous silicon thin film both are silicon only but the perovskite you put outside you will get a very dark spot on it like a reliability issue is there so for the more energy production we are not going but for the very less energy production like a small equipment uh, running only you can use it no problem at all i hope you have answer your question i think thank you sir next question is from gyan prakash he is asking what are the ar coating ppt or PP, uh, kpk blank on black sheet so no uh, for anti reflection coating the ar coating we are using a silicon nitride layer silicon nitride si and x we call it this layer is uh, in the range of around like uh, 80 to 100 nanometer wavelength suppose if you reduce this wavelength uh, sorry i uh, had 80 to 100 nanometer of thickness if you reduce this thickness further the color of the solar cell will change Uh, you see like uh, sometimes you see the blue color sometimes you do the very dark blue color sometimes you see the uh, maroon color cells right uh, it, uh, and all are in crystalline silicon only i'm not talking about uh, talking about any yeah. other uh, technology so uh, you can see like uh, this different kind of coating uh, right Re uh, resulted in a different kind of color so now why we use the only 80 to 100 nanometer wavelength because this anti reflection coating will help us to um, uh, to reduce the losses which is coming from the optical loss that means the more and more light is coming that will not be reflected back it will be total internal reflection will be there from the silicon nitride layer only so that part is very important so we use for silicon nitride uh, 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 layer we use the pcbd like plasma in high chemical vapor deposition for this uh, making this layer on the solar cells yes okay, sir next question is from alu he is asking that being a phd students how we can work with the industries collaborate with industries to solve practical problems okay that's a very good and application based questions 
uh, what you can do right now is that uh, uh, sometimes the professor used to have a project from the industry, right? So you can work on it while work, uh, like while studying there. Sometimes, uh, uh, like in Adani, we used to practice the uh, take an intern as a uh, as a for six months at least to do a project with us. So like I have few students with me, like one is from an IT Kuruk Chetra. Uh, this guy is doing on the project like IPMS, uh, inter uh, like uh, interconnected project management systems. So we are doing not only on the like uh, solar field or uh, uh, like energy field. We are also doing on the project management kind of like business um, development perspective as well. So you can take an internship uh, in any other company. You can just already your CV that you want to do a project. They will process through it. Or either you can come through the professor side that uh, this guy wanted to do a project with us and I, I know you have the problem statement and we are having the probable solution through that way also you can work with us no problem at all next question is from Nidram. she's uh, she's asking question from slide number 25 what is the necessity to use a front glass in bifacial solar cells structure as it may result in light reflection Instead, is there any scope for a thin lamination sheet? Uh, okay, you can even work without sheet also, no problem at all. But you cannot work for very long. Suppose what is happening? Uh, suppose um, in Indian climate we are talking about, especially on the Rajasthan, the dust dust storm will come, right? You know, the dust storm will come and it will settle on the cell. Okay, it will settle on the cell. That means it is blocking the sunlight on it. So it resulted in the different like uh, losses in the power production okay but if you don't put a glass on it that will have a problem but suppose you are putting a small glass the dust particle and all it is the glass is having this kind of uh, um, coating such that the dust particle will fall from it like having a hydrophobicity property on it such that like uh, any dust like soiling will occur when the like dust storm is also coming, the rain is also coming at the same time. The, it will settle there. So the based on the glass part here, the glass property, the coating on it uh, is not settling, uh, is not allowing them to settle on the glass surface. So that's why we need a glass on it. Secondly, if you talk about the other um, continent like uh, Europe or like somewhere like um, uh, European countries or like in the US and all that uh, northern northern part they are, they, they are having a hell storm you search for the any in Google like a uh, helm storm affected PV modules you will see a crack like uh, glass is totally cracked due to the helm storm and all so glass is anyhow get protecting uh, like for at least like a, a normal health storm Right, but for the very hand storm, like very hard to uh, sustain for a very long time, even with the glass. So that's why the glass is giving you the reliability, higher reliability for a very long period of operation. So you think in that way. So that's why, like, uh, you can use. But suppose, like, if you want to use this silicon cells only for a household thing, like uh, you are just putting here nearby your place, not direct to the sunlight, you can work it without even glass also. It will work. So it's up to your use case. Okay. I hope you answer your question. Sir, uh, I have a question. The tempered floating glass, the glass window, what are the properties of this glass? Is it okay. bad? Okay, yeah. So tempered, yeah. So there are like a very flat glass is coming, and that uh, second option is the flat, tempered glass. So tempered glass is having a bow kind of structure. Suppose is a one point. Uh, uh, 1.1 1 .1 meter square by uh, 1 meter, 1.1 uh, .1, around like 1.6 meter square. We have the area. If you uh, bow, like if you take up from both sides, so it will have some bow kind of structure. If it's coming bow kind of structure, then uh, the moment it going through the lamination process, which is like we are putting a pressure on it such that the encapsulated material uh, can get melted around 120 to 130 degrees Celsius of time. So the glass will not crack. And suppose you're putting a flat glass on it, suppose flat glass. The flat glass is having the both property, it will not bow. You pre pre uh, put a pressure on it during the lamination process, it will break. 
second is that more and more light which is coming on uh, uh, like a perpendicular basis that uh, that uh, particular light will be absorbed but the more and more uh, like um, uh, what do you call uh, like um, uh, different angle light incidence is there then the more chances that the light will be reflected back not even going inside the glass from outside the glass so that's why we are using this tempered glass the tempered glass is having both uh, uh, having two surface top and bottom like top one is having a you know like uh, some uh, uh, what you call a uh, pyramidal structures if you you can feel it the moment you touch it right so more and more light is coming and it is like just zigzag zigzag going inside only so they are like reflecting back inside and going back so this like light trapping uh, phenomena is having on that tempered glass but the bottom side is flat bottom side we don't have any uh, pyramids so all the light which is uh, zigzag coming here and going inside will directly go to the side so that is the property of using the tempered glass compared to the like normal glass that we have I have a follow-up question uh, about the light transmission. Uh, are they uh, UV trans transmitting, or uh, normally the glasses, normal glasses, not having transmission below 400 nanometer? So, normally they are transmission coated. Yes. So, uh, for this kind of purpose, we use a different kind of coating. We call like the electro. Uh, electrolytic deposition like um, what we used to do like uh, we put a um, two uh, electrode and one material like uh, one material is coming up material is like mainly the uh, not the polymer as well, I, i'm sure but the other material um, i'm not recalling that name but if you electrocute uh, around the cell surface and put a different layer, like the layer will be very small, around like 20 to 30 nanometer only. Like I'm talking about not uh, during the module fabrication process. I'm talking about other than the fabrication process that you bought the module. Now you're putting this one. This one will increase more and more lights. Like uh, the way you are saying, like the 400 nanometer uh, lesser than that one, the light will not be trapped. Okay, no problem at that. But more, more than that one, uh, 400 onwards, because the crystalline silicon material is able to capture and convert into the electron hole pair at the range of 600 nanometer wavelength because the because of this band gap phase, right? So um, our um, target is around like uh, 500 to 800 nanometer wavelength. The crystalline silicon material can capture the light. Forget about the 400 nanometer band. Like if it is coming, is okay. No, no worries. It always can't in the blue loss. The blue loss is always constant for us. Like we cannot do anything with that. But we always make sure, like especially on the range of like uh, 500 to uh, 700 one, we have the more and more uh, light trapping. So that's the phenomena uh, for the tempered glass that we use. Like uh, even like we are having a lo loss less than 400 nanometers. No, no, no worries about it. Thank you, sir. Next question is from Vanamma. Uh, she's asking that can bifacial solar PV modules be integrated into building materials? Are there are any specific installation requirements? Ah uh, yes, actually, um, we have to handle with care. First of all, this one like uh, the BIPV things have not started in India. The problem is that only few people are doing that part, especially on the research purpose. They are doing only few professors like from. Uh, IIT Bombay and CPRE lab, they are planning to do some BIPV studies. And uh, if you want to see the application oriented, uh, like, and uh, industries doing that one, like, not major industry are uh, planning to go for the BIPV, only very few startups from outside, like, not talking about India, uh, like, you talk about the Singapore one. So there are like, um, zero energy building that we have in the national university of singapore zero energy building where the glasses are made up of the bipv one the bipv generating like a like a having the vertical structures always like not uh, more light is coming most of the light is getting reflected back but still we have a chances of like making a uh, generating something like uh, you can at least run one fan or two fan out of it Right, but we are having like we are just reducing the consumption for, which is coming from the grid. Now the second thing is that how we make the BIPV more attractive, more uh, more usable for the user purpose. So you 
put a coating on the top of the glass. Like suppose you take a normal PV module, you put a printing, like you just make your own uh, portrait on it. Okay. And make a portrait in such a way that each pixel of your portrait is having a diff uh, like uh, having a gap gap where the light can go inside and generate the power. So like that way the BIPV is working. So both glass glass one we are also using even the glass back sheet BIPV is also there. You can see that one like uh, when you Google it like sorry I didn't have this slide here, but uh, I wish like uh, uh, the India will progress further very further like after the uh, I would say like uh, after 2040 or 2050 once we become a developed country. I would say like we will have a huge area to do the BIPV one because we will have a high rise building and the high rise building uh, we are able to capture all the lights there itself so we can generate uh, we can make our zero uh, uh, zero energy building as well. Yeah. Thank you so much sir. Due to time constraint, we are not taking other queries, but I request Dr. Hasmu, so please address them in chat box. And thank you so much, sir, for your such an informative uh, information and your time. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, moving ahead, our next speaker for the session is Professor Pradeep K. Nair from Department of Electrical Engineering from IIT Bombay. Professor Nair completed his master's from IIT Bombay and PhD from Purdue University, USA. His research area of interest include modeling and simulation of technologies that are useful to finding new application of electronic devices, such as nanoscale devices for energy conversion, healthcare application, NEMS, and so on. He received excellent teaching award in 2020 IIT Bombay, Professor Preeti Ram Pritan Award for Creative Research by Young Faculty 2018, and many more. Brief introduction, now I would like to invite Professor Nair for his talk on Perbocyte Solar Cell. Okay, uh, good morning everyone uh, and morning. thank you for um, inviting me to this online workshop. Uh, so let me uh, share the slides and uh, let me know in case like you, know, you have any difficulties in viewing them. Okay. Uh, could you please check whether I am given the privileges to share my slide? Because I don't. Yes, uh, yes, it is. Okay, so are my slides uh, visible to you? Yes. OK, so uh, uh, once again, uh, thank you and a warm welcome to you all uh, who have joined for this workshop. Um, they have had like, you know, uh, the organizers have selected uh, very relevant topics for this workshop. And then I assume that uh, like, you know, by the by the end of this workshop, you will be getting a good overview about like you know, some of the exciting research which are happening in this uh, broad areas of sensors and after electronic devices. <clears throat> Okay, so um, as uh, mentioned in the introduction, like, you know, I teach at IIT Bombay and then uh, uh, solar cells is one of the topics that I work on. And uh, among them, uh, there's this class of uh, solar cells, which are known as perovskite solar cells, uh, which are like, you know, uh, attracting a significant amount of uh, interest these days. And this talk is uh, more or less about that. And uh, I see from the, uh, from the, like, you know, that the topics that are listed for the, for the rest of the day, there are one or two <coughs> other topics also, uh, which are like you know broadly on this area. So, so with this, like you know, uh, along with the introductory talk uh, that we just had, this would give you a nice overview of like you know uh, where this PV industry is heading to and what are the uh, the new developments that are taking place. Okay, so um, you might have heard um, uh, in the previous lecture, like you know, enough about uh, what is the motivation for uh, for photovoltaics as such, but then let me spend a couple of slides to uh, bring things in perspective. And um, uh, please note that like now I, I do have the slide number in my uh, slides, 
in case there is a inordinate uh, delay between like you know the the slides that i show or the slides that is visible to you and then the the topic that i discuss do let me know like you know i may, I may pause and then uh, uh, we, we may see what can be done okay so the slide on the left side uh, left top left is uh, in fact the world energy scenario it shows like you know how the uh, with respect to time how the various different components are uh, expected to contribute towards the world energy scenario and uh, even though we are now in this uh, like you know close to 2025 uh, still the majority of the energy is like you know that, that we consume is actually provided by fossil fuels there are few uh, renewable energies that are uh, definitely like you know making uh, significant progress and uh, one among them is solar uh, like you know the photovoltaics where in which we aim to convert the energy that is given for free from the by, by the sun and then uh, we can convert that and then make use of for our uh, uh, for, for meeting our energy demand in fact this uh, as of now the the share by the renewable energies is not the the dominant one but then what is uh, advantages for photovoltaics is that uh, th there is abundant amount of energy that is being like you know provided by the sun so if you look at the top right uh, plot then that shows the the solar uh, irradiation on the the planet and there are these few black dots that are being placed there and even though those dots may look at small like in they do cover significant amount of area and the argument is that like you know, if you somehow tap the entire amount of solar energy that is incident in any of these dot then that would be sufficient for meeting the the, the world energy demand so uh, so this is a, like you know a, a very very prospective situation a significant amount of energy is given to you for free you only need to uh, to have the appropriate technology by which it can be tapped in a commercial manner and this is not something that is new. It has been realized long time back itself. The history of solar cells goes back to around the 50s, 60s. And then in our country also, like, you know, there has been uh, a significant push towards, like, you know, increasing the, the solar footprint. And there has been the National Solar Mission, which aimed to generate close to 100 gigawatts by 2022. Uh, we are not quite there, but then uh, in spite of that, um, it, it is well accepted that, like, you know, the significant amount of, like, you know, solar capacity installation has happened in our country even though we missed we might have missed that target by like you know by by, by a significant fraction and the solar uh, solar farms are coming up like you know in all sorts of uh, terrains uh, it's there in uh, arid areas and on the other hand like you know there are these other interesting uh, places where the solar farms are coming in for example what is shown on the the bottom right is a floating solar farm from a, from a reservoir in kerala and um, uh, so there are like you know different different aspects that which go into uh, in times of deciding like you know where you may want to put a solar farm and what type of technology and all so today this uh, talk like you know, I'll, I'll sort of you know try to walk through some of the the important aspects and then at a device level how one would characterize them maybe at some other occasion we may talk about like you know the system level aspects okay so moving forward uh, when it comes to like you know this is what we are talking about is a is a technology that uh, should be out there in the market and not just in the lab so uh, commercialization aspects like you know always hinges on um, uh, the, the economic viability so when it comes to solar cells there are these three important parameters which are very uh, which one should always keep in mind so these are like you know the, the cost that is being involved in that and then the efficiency of the solar cells by which like you know, it may convert the the incident solar uh, power into uh, usable electrical energy and this is the lifetime of the, the module also so it is this like you know a, a optimization between these three important aspects which might dictate like you know uh, or which might prefer one technology versus the other uh, and then uh, this is the technology where the the challenges are like you know across the challenges of scale are like you know several orders of magnitude and th that will become evident later on also so we have a, a challenge at the nanometer scale in the sense that like you know the interfaces between various materials at a nanometer level should be uh, should be optimized and at the same time the solar cells that one manufacture like you know eventually has to um, they, they have to be of the size of like you know 150 centimeters square or even larger and then the the solar panels have to cover several uh, square kilometers of area so there is a uh, essentially a challenge in scale one has to perfect what happens at a nanometer scale and at the same time, like, you know, that has to be scaled up to uh, across large areas. And on the other hand, there is a challenge in terms of the, the time scales that are involved. Some of the, the physical phenomena that are involved are, in fact, like, you know, of the scale of nanoseconds of microseconds. 
the recombination phenomena, transport, collection, and other things are essentially happening at like you know at a very very uh, small time span. And on the other hand, this uh, the the solar panels that we eventually fabricate has to be there in the the field day in and day out in the ambient conditions for multiple years. So there is a change in the, the, the challenge in terms of the scale as well. And in addition to that, there is a challenge in terms of the, the cost or the economy that is being involved in it. Like, you know, because this is a field where there are significant amount of, amount of, uh, amount of like, you know, other challenging uh, or competing technologies. For example, you might be having like, you know, electricity from hydroelectric power, pl power plants, where once you construct that, there is no much of uh, running cost as such. And then the, the cost of the electricity could be cheap. In fact, like, you know, it's one of the most cheaper ones. And on the other hand, like, you know, there could be other uh, fossil fuel based uh, power plants and other things. So this is a technology where you have to com compete with several other existing technologies. And eventually the amount of like, you know, uh, 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 the money that you, one might pay for a unit of electricity is like, you know, people might be worried about whether there is a difference in like, you know, half a rupee, uh, quarter a rupee and other things. And that actually matters. Of course, the volume is used. Then it's not just like, you know, that one is not bargaining for that half a rupee, but it's over a, a larger amount. But still, like, you know, to the common public, like, you know, it may eventually come to uh, differentiating between one technology versus the other in terms of like, in you know, a few rupees or half a rupee. But on the other hand, like, you know, the, the other semiconductor technologies, like, you know, microprocessors and other things, um, a microprocessor might be selling at hundreds of dollars. But then there is no alternative to a microprocessor. There is no fossil fuel based microprocessor, which is like, you know, competing to the semiconductor based microprocessor. So there might be a couple of different technologies. IPS might be different. Architectures might be different. But still the price range is like, you know, within the, the same order. Here, there is like, you know, co co competition from um, uh, from other technologies, like, you know, uh, which, which is like, you know, a lot more intense in this area. So you can see that, like, you know, when it comes to photovoltaics, this is, um, uh, even with respect to the, the semiconductor devices, this is a very, very challenging field because of the, the challenges in terms of the scale, challenges in terms of the, uh, challenge of the scale, which involves like, you know, in terms of spatial dimensions, in terms of time, and in terms of the uh, uh, challenges from the, the other, other technologies. So in, in many ways, one can <clears throat> compare the photovoltaics technologies to the, the field of athletics. Right. So the, the images on the right side, I'm sure that like, you know, you would uh, at least recognize one of them. So the one on the top is no, none other than Usain Bolt, who uh, is the world record holder in uh, 100 meter and 200 meters uh, sprint. And uh, the, the bottom one is um, uh, Kipchoge. And Kipchoge is a celebrated marathon runner. And uh, he, he lost his uh, world record for marathon, uh, the full marathon, uh, just by a whisker a few days, a uh, few months back or so. But then Kipchoge still is the only only uh, only human to have completed the, the marathon in less than two hours, even under some special conditions. Right. So one can compare like, you know, the traditional semiconductor processors and other things is like, you know, where you are actually looking for extremely good performance, small ID devices. So that is some more comparable to Bolt running like, you know, 100 meter at sub 10, uh, uh, sub 10 seconds or something like that. But on the other hand, photovoltaic technology is something like that that should be there in the field for close to like you know, 25 or 30 years. And it's not just that like you know, it should remain there. We expect that its performance should also be close to the, the, the ideal uh, ideal limits. For example, in this the golden triangle that I've shown here, the, there are a few numbers which are mentioned here. Like you know, the current silicon technology and perovskite also gives you efficiencies which are like you know, close to 26 percentage. Silicon, of course, gives that for a larger uh, larger area. Perovskite, the area might be much, much, much smaller than that. But then that 26 percentage is like you know close to the theoretical limits of 29 or 30 percentage. That is that, that is theoretically possible. Now you can see that the, the photovoltaic technology is performing very very close to the ideal limits, right? And at the same time, uh, so that sort of performance you expect it for about 25 to 30 years. Now you can see that like you know this is like you know uh, the, the the demands from a um, photovoltaic industry is almost similar to asking Usain Bolt to compete or like, you know, complete the entire marathon uh, at his top speed, uh, what, whatever be the top speed that he could achieve in uh, in the 100 meter sprint, right? So it's a indeed a very, very demanding field. But in spite of that, like, you know, due to the several engineering uh, improvements uh, over the years, the, the field deployment of PV has increased significantly and is expected to increase continuously for the 
uh, for the next uh, few years definitely okay so this is the context of like you know the the uh, the, the pv assets in terms of like you know the various demands and where it is with respect to the traditional uh, semiconductor devices and uh, the the other competing technologies so when it comes to um, photovoltaic technology like you know there is this one parameter which is known as lcoe i missed to explain this in the the few in the earlier uh, slide so this this is called the levelized cost of energy or the electricity which sort of you know gives you or like you know it uh, summarizes the influence of various parameters into or the various uh, the, the factors which affect the or, uh, factors which are like you know which are which are playing a role uh, and so that like you know you can uh, compare different technologies so this lcoe is essentially like you know the is the ratio of the the total amount of um, energy that you would be getting upon the total amount, the, the total cost so you can see that as the efficiency increases then the levelized cost of energy would decrease and similarly if the lifetime increases then the levelized cost of energy decreases so the, this is a common this is a very oft used parameter which is like which can help you to compare between different different technologies so the aim is that to identify schemes by which the lcoe is like you know is uh, on the lower side of the other competing technologies such that like you know a particular technology can come up as a uh, as a winner or like you know the, the next leading one and the the plot on the right side shows the variation of the efficiency with respect to time uh, so i plotted like you know this there is a uh, famous chart uh, in this regard which is prepared by the national renewable energy from usa so i have sort of you know sampled uh, only, only two of those curves and this i did sometime back in 2020 and i have not updated it since then but the numbers have not changed much so you can see that like you know the, the dominant technology out there is based on crystalline silicon it took a long time to uh, optimize and reach up to this stage and uh, you can see that like in you know, the efficiency sort of you know the champion efficiency the record efficiency uh, sort of uh, has been like you know uh, remaining nearly a constant over the last uh, 20 years or so uh, but but then nevertheless because of the other engineering uh, optimization and then the uh uh the 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 cost reductions that are associated with it has in fact like you know resulted in increased amount of deployment of crystalline silicon technology so the crystalline silicon tech based technology is the the market leader were close to 90 percentage or more of the all the deployments is based on that there are other uh, few technologies as well but over the last um, 10 or 15 years there has been this new technology which has emerged which goes by this name perovskite this is a material classification and this perovskite technology like in has improved tremendously over the last 10 years or so and uh, these days they report numbers like you know which are very close to that of the crystalline silicon with with a important caveat the, the difference is that the crystalline silicon reports this efficiency on a large area solar cell like a 5 inch by 5 inch solar cell like you know so that will be like a diode which is of the same footprint as your your notebook maybe or a four size uh, sheet paper and the perovskite like in you know, this uh, numbers they have, they have reported but that it's only over a small area much less than 1 cm square so there is a lot more that needs to be done on this particular field of like in you know, perovskite solar cell it has certain advantages which we will see but then uh, there are like you know enough promises also so we will uh, go through we will uh, have a glimpse of uh, the perovskite silicon like perovskite uh, uh, solar cell and then uh, we'll also then try to under, uh, understand like you know how one characterizes the uh, the recombination phenomena in perovskite solar cells right okay so going forward uh, if you want to understand uh, photovoltaics then uh, the, the, this single slide is somewhat uh, or like you know more or less good enough and if you can make sense of this then uh, like you know you have sort of you know, uh, understood more than half of the photovoltaics then the, 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 the parametric dependence of various terms on the individual phenomena is the only thing that one needs to fill up and that, that may take some time but then let's start so what we need from photovoltaics is like you know a device an electronic a, a device which absorbs the solar spectrum so this, this is the input the solar spectrum and then it generates <coughs> current when we say that it generates current typically like you know these devices are semiconductors so when we we know that like you know when the light is being incident on a semiconductor it creates electrons and holes these are the free carriers and then so if the material absorbs the the photons it may create electrons and holes so the band gap comes into the play so first the first criteria is that it should be able to absorb the the light and then the second criteria is that as the light is being absorbed it should create free electron hole pairs 
like and that, that's not always a given there are like you know the common semiconductor materials like you know silicon gallium arsenide and all um like you know that they would create electron pole pairs because like you know the 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 force of attraction between the 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 bound electron hole pair or the exciton which is otherwise not is not significantly last so it would easily create electron hole pairs but then there are other materials essentially like an you know, organics or polymer based materials where the, the the light might be absorbed but then the resulting uh, pair is is a exciton it's a bound electron hole pair and then you would have to have additional schemes to split them okay so it's not enough that the light is being absorbed uh, what we need is that it should re uh, result in free electron hole pair generation okay so the, the next part is that this electron hole pair generation like you know these are like reactive gases they, they may uh, they may react and then if they react then it is of no use that means the, like you know, when the electron and the hole if they recombine then it is no no use that like you know that incident photon has literally been like you know uh, wasted we, we have not taken advantage of that the incident photon came it created electron hole pairs but then the electron hole pair recombine and then the resulting energy might have been sent to the lattice as heat in one case so it's of no use to us so one should be able to collect the electron hole pair and then it should, we should be able to collect these electrons and holes on two separate contacts that's that's very important right so we need to separate and then the collect the electrons and holes in two separate contacts so if you can find uh, identify a material which sort of you know does only these three uh, that then sort of you know you have solved the the energy problem of the world but unfortunately like you know the world or the nature is not always so kind to us then uh, even if we sort of you know identify a scheme by which okay it uh, absorbs light it creates electron hole pairs and the electron hole pairs can indeed be sent to two separate contacts there are some other detrimental aspects that one has to worry about and one of them is that like you know as you can see that okay this device might be connected to a load uh, as in this case the load is a simple resistor okay and then the current is being fed to the load you can see that in that case across the load there will be a voltage that is being applied or voltage that is being generated and that voltage is being sort of, sort of you know is common to the device as well so one has to worry about like you know due to that like you know the, the voltage that develops across it whether there is going to be injection current or not and this injection current is like you know, in many cases is simply termed as a dark current uh, it need not be always same as the dark current but one has to worry about the, the injection current and in addition to that one has to worry about the recombination of carriers right so when it comes to like you know optimizing a, a solar cell all that you have to do is that like you have to sort of you know make the scheme better and better in which the 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 phenomena uh, listed on the left side a b c are like you know are uh, at their optimal best and then uh, you have to have the device architecture in such a way that the dark current and the recombination of carriers are like you know brought to their minimum and under those conditions like you know one can even write the the jv characteristics of that particular device in rather simple terms so if you write the j as the j, so j is the current density which is written as i upon a so the j is nothing but the current due to photogenerated carriers and it should be subtracted from the current due to current injection right so the, the, there is a photogenerated carriers which are attempting to come out and because of the effective voltage across its terminals there might be injection current which is like in you know, a current which uh, attempts to travel in the opposite direction and once we bring in the appropriate uh, notation in terms of like you know one of these current should be positive and the other should be negative we arrive at the the jv characteristics for a, a simple solar cell as given by minus q integral of g minus r dx plus the j injection so the g is the photo generation rate and the r is the recombination now how, how would one find the g the g one has to find by considering that okay this of this the uh, electromagnetic radiation across several wavelengths that is getting coupled to a device so one has to figure out like you know uh, that uh, coupling of that electromagnetic wave uh, radiation which is the solar spectrum into a semiconductor and how the semiconductor absorbs that so in principle like you know if you uh, recollect something that you might have done in your courses like electromagnetics or so you might have seen like you know uh, propagation of waves reflection and other things and propagation of waves through um, media where there is some sort of loss uh, you will be able to connect that to this one like you know how one can uh, understand uh, how much light is getting absorbed in a particular media so the generation is like you know this is something that one can compute based on the input spectrum and the material properties like the refractive indexes the complex uh, refractive indices so one uh, one can find the the generation rate inside the material and then the other is the recombination rate how much recombination happens inside the device right 
and the, the last part is the the dark current which one can like you know uh, definitely uh, have a first order uh, answer to that by characterizing that device in the absence of the light so once you have all these pieces in place then uh, you, you have sort of you know you have, uh, you, you are in a, uh, in the right position to to optimize that device and then see how better or uh, how much its efficiency could be improved so we will uh, um, have some focus on the recombination uh, in today's session. So when it comes to recombination semiconductor uh, devices, like you know, at least for photovoltaic devices, one has to worry about like you know, at least three different types of recombination phenomena. Okay, so I'll, I'll start with the the one in the the center. This is known as the radiator recombination. In this case, a electron will be directly recombining with respect to a hole, and then the energy difference actually comes out as a photon. So this is called a radiator recombination. And this is also something like, you know, you, you are familiar, you, uh, at least like you know, the practical applications is very familiar to you. All the LEDs that you see around uh, rely on this mechanism uh, for, for like, you know, this is the mechanism by which LEDs generate light. And, but then <coughs> this, is, this is a fundamental mechanism. You cannot turn it off. You can see that like it only depends upon the presence of electrons and holes and whether the material is a direct band gap also. So if there is like, you know, electrons and hole, then this uh, recombination could happen it, at its own rate. And there is nothing that you can uh, do it uh, do to it. It is a fundamental mechanism. And there are other radi uh, other recombination mechanisms also. So the one uh, shown on the left is known as a trap assisted recombination mechanism. It goes by this SRH. This is, comes from the, the people who did similar work on this particular field, Shockley report. So here what happens is that instead of the a direct transition from the conduction band to the valence band, the electron first transitions to a trap state. And this trap state could be due to various imperfections in the lattice, some other impurity ions and other things. Uh, so these are like, you know, some uh, states which are there uh, due to the quote unquote imperfections in the lattice. So the electron would transition to that and then later transition to the to the conduction, uh, to the valence band. So the uh, result of all of this is that like, you know, in one such recombination process, it results in a loss of one electron hole pair. And uh, while in the ready to recombination, the energy would be coming out as a photon in trap assisted recombination, the resultant energy is usually dissipated into the, the lattice as, as heat. And the trap assisted recombination, like, you know, it depends upon the density of the traps that are available. More than a number of traps, more would be the recombination. So here, this is one case where by making the material more and more pure, like if you increase the purity level, reduce the imperfections in the uh, the crystal lattice, then the uh, trapezoidal recombination would reduce. So one can like, you know, by um, uh, tuning the, the material purity, one can reduce the trapezoidal recombination, but the radiator recombination is something like, you know, that you can't, um, you, you can't touch. Like if you, you, you may choose a different material, which gives you a different properties, but a given material, in the, it, it's uh, more fundamental. There are also other recombination mechanisms like an you know, OJ recombination, where it depends upon, like you know, it's a, it's a multi-body uh, uh, process as such. Uh, so here you can see that, um, say we might be starting with a initial condition of two electrons and one hole, and one electron and a hole recombines, but then the resultant energy does not come out as a photon as in the radiator recombination, but then that resultant energy is taken up by the, the nearby electron, which goes up uh, higher in the energy landscape, and then later it may uh, re uh, it, it may relax by dissipating that energy. So one has to worry about like you know the, these three uh, recombination mechanisms, and the, the, these recombination mechanisms have their own signature in terms of the device uh, physics, and uh, one needs to have like you know means by which you can characterize them. You can you have to characterize them both at a device level when the device has been fabricated, it's completed or even at a material level itself, because if that the material level, if the quality is poor, then there is no point in like, taking it further and then completing the, the entire device. Right? So this characterization of this
think you are muted by mistake. Your mic is muted. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, so so uh, I, I got a message that the mic has been muted. And in fact, it was not done from my side. Uh, somebody from the, the audience might have done that. And I'm not sure um, where should I restart from. Can someone help me? From the characterization. Hello? Yeah, from the current side. From the current slide. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, what is being shown on the uh, top left is the, the architecture of a typical perovskite solar cell. So the perovskite, the word, is actually used to describe all sorts of materials, like, you know, which can be described by the formula ABX3. And uh, this is the general class. And the perovskites for photovoltaics are uh, like you know a couple of examples are being shown here where the a b and x3 this is a a combination of halide uh, organic and the inorganic ones so the a could be a uh, methyl ammonium and then the b is a halide and then the so so this a is a methyl ammonium b could be halide uh, the, uh, the the metal compound and the x is a halide compound so the structure is being shown here you can see that the b is there at the center and then uh, the halogen is there on the, the the green ones and then the the methyl ammoniums are the, the the purple ones okay and in this architecture this perovskite material is in fact sandwiched between two different other materials which are known as an electron transport layer and a hole transport layer okay so then there is a special need for that unless you do it this way uh, it may not work on uh, work that very well i'll explain that why that is the case and then in addition to that so this this uh, so we have this is the active material this is the one that the perovskite is a material that is going to absorb the, the solar spectrum. And then uh, it is sandwiched between ETL and the STL. So you'd be having a transparent electron on the front side and the light would be coming through that. And on the back side, there could be a metal contact. And you know, one could like, you know, uh, flip it the other way also. So the light might be coming from the other side also. So there are like, you know, NIP versus PIN structures and other things, which like if need be, we'll get to it. But then what actually works well for these perovskite materials is the fact that these materials have got can muted, sir. Again muted, sir. So we cannot able to hear you. Hello, sir. We are not able to hear you. No audio, sir. It's not king of the call. Sir, kindly unmute yourself, please. Okay, so uh, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. yes, so there is someone in the audience who is like, you know, uh, 
who is muting me I, I, i don't know why or like you know who, who is doing that uh, suddenly it's not done by me and in, in case you are trying to be cute or you are trying to playing a prank <laughs> well this is not the uh, the venue for that uh, so please refrain from doing that like you know so so uh, in in case uh, someone wants to mute me like you no know, let uh, the, the organ- organizers do that uh, others please uh, keep your mouse off from the uh, from such activities okay and uh, uh, in case like you know it happens again uh, you may like you know the, i request the organizers to directly alert me right because if you are trying to send messages in whatsapp and all um, i may not be checking that right when i when i when typically when we giving a, we give a presentation or something like that we are focusing only on the material that is in front S- same is the case with classroom teaching as well okay so uh, here we go again okay so so i will start with the the description uh, and uh, as i said before in case i goes muted please alert me or like you know, if in case you can unmute please do it yourself okay uh, either case alert me okay so the absorption properties of these materials are uh, like you know comparable to that of gallium arsenide and hence um, uh, like you know that this uh, that they can uh, absorb the entire solar spectrum in a very very uh, small thickness okay now if you want to understand these cells like you know, i have shown that this is the architecture so we are now in slide number 9 this is the architecture the active material electron transport layer and hole transport layer how do we even try to understand that so you to try to understand that let's try to draw an analogy with respect to some device that we presumably we all know so that would be the the pn junction solar cell so we have seen this pn junction diodes and other things and uh, all crystalline silicon solar cells are like you know derivatives of the pn junction solar cell so the way a pn junction solar cell works is that okay you might be having a junction there is a p type n type and the photon comes it creates electron hole pairs and then so this junction serves the purpose that all the electrons sort of you know if you see all the electrons which are being generated in the n site then uh, those electrons would find that like you know, there is a potential barrier and all the electrons are being pushed to one side similarly the electrons which are generated in the p side also they can drift to the uh, drift down the potential barrier and then get can get collected on one side of course some electrons could be lost on the other side as well and similar argument happens for with respect to the holes as well and in a pn junction solar cell the typical thicknesses are of the order of 200 micrometer or so and the junction area is only about a about maximum like you know of the order of a micrometer so of the 200 micrometer the 199 micrometers of the thickness You, you don't have any appreciable electric field so the carrier transport essentially happens through diffusion so this is a device that has been like you know dominated by diffusion limited transport but on the other hand this architecture is somewhat different this is one material perovskite is one material and the electron transport layer and the hole transport layers could be completely different materials and then we would like to understand like you know, how these devices work and since this is like you know a somewhat complex structure we will start with the description for a, a simple metal and a semiconductor and a metal device so the the schematic that is being shown here is that it is a metal semiconductor metal de- device okay so i'm trying to understand how the perovskite device would work if we did not have the electron transport or the hole transport layer we just have the metals on either side right so the resultant band diagram under like you know equilibrium conditions or like in v equals 0 is being shown here so i'm uh, assuming that the the material that we are using is intrinsic there is not appreciable amount of charge inside the material so you can see that the the work functions of these two materials are now aligned <laughs> under equilibrium conditions and then when you shine the light okay it creates electron hole pairs and these electrons which are generated would be now drifting down to the other side under the influence of the the built in electric field so a metal semiconductor metal device if the uh, the, the semiconductor is intrinsic is actually a, a device which is like you know domain which is controlled by drift of electronic carriers it is not by the diffusion at least under v equals 0 and that is in contrast with respect to the, the other device okay if that is the case then uh, let's try to see like you know okay we understand it how it would work at v equals 0 let's see when, when we apply a voltage how this would happen and uh, the, this slide and the next slide are a little bit like you know little like you no know, as others call as busy slides uh, i typically refrain from using animations during uh, online talk because like you know there could be a delay otherwise with animation this would have come out rather nice and clean but then still uh, let me attempt like you know, i'll i'll try to walk you through so this is our uh, the device like you know this intrinsic semiconductor 
there is a metal <coughs> on either side different metals so the first one we have see this is the band diagram under b equals zero conditions you can see that all electrons which are being generated <coughs> will be collected on the right side and the whole holes would be which are generated would be collected on the left side so you'll be getting a significant amount of current which is known as the the short circuit current but then certain curious things happen because for example if you apply v equals vbi for this particular device right so v equals vbi makes the bands flat and then the resultant energy band diagram would look like this in this case the all the generated electrons have got like you know equal probability of going to either to the left contact or to the right contact right and similar is the case with like you know the generated holes this could go either to the left contact or to the right contact so so we are ignoring any recombination in this case the combination might bring in like you know some more qualitative differences but even in the absence of any recombination you can see that the moment you apply v equals vbi you are witnessing a scenario in which the same number of electrons and same number of holes are like you know trying to exit through one contact which means that the total current is zero so if you are starting with a metal semiconductor metal device <coughs> then by definition the photo current would go to zero at v equals vbi that means like you, know, you you are not going to get a voc which is more than v equals vbi and that is a critical limitation and the way to overcome this limitation would be to modify this metal semiconductor metal device by introducing a hole transport layer and the electron transport layer and the the, the working would be uh, uh, is like you know is again uh, described by the cartoons on the left side say let, let's focus on the top uh, the, the top left one if the, that like you know uh, if you can make sense of that then the rest of the things would uh, follow naturally so we, when we have a hole transport layer it is by definition it's something like it has some property by which it blocks the transport of electrons and it only allows the transport of holes so you see on the left hand side a hole transport layer would block the transport of any electrons under all conditions and it allows only the transport of holes similarly electron transport layer allows the transport of electrons and it would block the transport of holes so you can see that here a electron transport layer if it is going to be placed in this side it would block the transport of electrons uh, the transport of holes and it would only allow electrons okay so that is our scheme and under v equals zero it's not going to make much of a difference because there's already a built-in electric field all electrons are anyway drifting down and then only attempt going to collect on the <coughs> right side contact so it's not going to make much of a difference but the moment you apply v equals vbi you see that it makes a more, uh, huge difference for example even under v equals vbi in our earlier case the electrons were getting split or electron both electrons and holes were getting split they were like you know moving half to one side and the other half to the other side here if you have that hole transport layer it would block the transport of electrons so all the electrons would be then forced to move to the right side and similarly all the holes would be moving uh, forced to move towards the left side so as a result if you have a scheme like this where the active material is sandwiched between that electron transport layer and the hole transport layer with that appropriate desired properties then the the condition at which the current goes to zero is sort of you know gets decoupled from the inherent built in voltage of the device and it could give significant amount of current and for such devices the eventual characteristics are going to be dictated by the recombination and the perovskite solar cells achieve this by using like you know different materials such as the electron transport layer and the hole transport layer where this desired properties are achieved by band level alignments so typically this uh, etl and the stl would be large band gap materials and the hole transport layer would be creating a a large barrier for the electrons to cross over similarly the electron transport layer would be pro, uh, having a large barrier for the holes to cross over which prevents the holes to cross over so with these mechanisms and with the continuous uh, improvement in the materials that are being used these devices now report like you know efficiencies which are uh, almost comparable to that of the crystalline silicon devices so this is a, a recent result from uh, one of the reputed journals you can see that the power conversion efficiency is close to 26 percentage or so <clears throat> but then uh, th there is an important uh, distinction that one needs to understand this happens for a device like you know regular like, this has been demonstrated for a device whose area is like you know much much smaller than uh, one centimeter square or on the other hand silicon solar cells report these numbers for a large area solar cell okay now <clears throat> uh, having said that we have sort of you know uh, obtained a feel of like you know what are the things that are involved in the which makes a perovskite solar cell good it is that first of all the material itself the material properties should be good it should absorb very well the transport properties are good 
then you should sandwich it with like you know the appropriate materials which will ensure that the electrons and the holes will be collected in the separate contacts without that like you know, it may not be uh, working that well and then one has to worry about the recombination mechanisms also the mechanisms by which the the carriers recombine recombine and that becomes some sort of a show stopper in many cases and the, one needs to characterize them okay characterize what would be the rate by which these recombination uh, phenomena would happen and how could one uh, like you know maybe improve the material architecture or the processing and other things by which it can be improved so this <coughs> phenomena like in you know, a characterization uh, is like you know, is fundamental also fundamental importance and this can be attempted at like you know at least two different levels one is that like you know you would fabricate the device and then there would be this question of okay what might be the the recombination rate inside my device can i try to measure it or infer it from the the iv characteristics because once the device has been fabricated then all that is left to is like you know two terminals right you may shine light to that and you can observe how much the current and the voltage would vary under various conditions so then uh, it, it is indeed possible to get some insights regarding the recombination phenomena from several aspects of the uh, terminal jv characteristics for example one could look at the ideality factors in the dark and the light that would uh, uh, allow you to uh, figure out like you know what might be the dominant recombination mechanisms you could also use like you know intensity dependent measurements like you know you, you may change the intensity and then observe how the voc decays with respect to voc or the jsc decays with respect to time and that would tell you uh, give you some feel about like you know what might be the recombination rates that are involved in that you may also um, try to make the make use of this device as a led because like you know if you uh, uh, if you operate this device under dark conditions and then you pump in a significant amount of electrons and holes they recombine and a fraction of them could be giving out the photons so you can also look into the electroluminescence part and then see how much would be the uh, uh, the recombination rate but then this is like you know this is definitely a good scheme to have but then uh, one uh, ideal case is like you know one should not wait your entire device is being fabricated packaged and then like you know then worry about what would be the recombination rate right that, that, that is like you know too too late one should do the optimization at various levels and even at a material level itself even before you have fabricated the device one should be able to figure out okay what might be the recombination rates is this material good enough whether it's going to go the entire distance or else like if the material like even after uh, the if the material quality is not good how would one tweak the processing and other things by which like you know the the starting material quality itself is good and there are like you know several <coughs> uh, uh, mechanisms by which or like you know measurement techniques by which one can ascertain the recombination parameters and few of them are like you know known as uh, spectroscopic measurements and uh, there are like you know several classes of that one of them could be like you, know, you might be looking into the the, the photoluminescence okay so you might be having the, the material like in you know, as a thin film and then you would excite it with a uh, uh, with the photons of a particular energy whose energy is like you know on the larger side of the the, the band gap and then you would observe like you know what would be the, the radiative recombination that is happening inside that you turn the, the probe that you are using like you know the, the excitation you may turn it on and off and then see what is the typical rate by which the <coughs> Uh, the, the photons that are coming out due to the radiative recombination whose energy would be the same as the band gap and there's a so photoluminescence how the photoluminescence characteristics would vary the, the, there is a very well known method and there are like you know this time resolved pl and other things by which you can look into the transients and then get the uh, get the uh, rates of recombination and there are also these other kinds of techniques which is like you know slightly more complex than that because in a, in a typical pl scheme it's like you know you are exciting it with respect to a uh, high energy photon and then you are looking at the transients of the the radiative recombination that is coming out the, the photons will be and the slightly more complex would be uh, this class of measurements which are known as this pump probe spectroscopy where you would be continuously like you know you, the, there is a pump signal uh, which is like you know definitely whose energy is larger than that of the the band gap of the material which you might be turned on and off so the pump signal is being shown here like you know this like you know you might be giving uh pulses of that like you know high energy pulses and there's also another probe signal which might be of like you know significantly smaller in energy and you are uh, trying to see what happens to the probe signal okay so the probe signal could be could be reflected from that material like you know it may <clears throat> some part could be absorbed in that and then it might be transmitted as well so the amount of the the transmittance and other things depends upon how much of this probe signal is getting absorbed in the material and if you are <coughs> excuse me 
and if you are looking at the the appropriate like you know the the wavelength range of course the the prop signal several complex phenomena might go inside that but then uh, if you are like you know uh, looking at certain appropriate conditions then it so uh, you can you can infer that the the absorption of the the prop signal can be like you know can can be directly correlated to the carrier density so that like the, there lies the important aspect that what happens to the prop signal under certain conditions can be directly correlated to the carrier density inside the device and that actually gives you a scheme by which one can measure how the carrier density inside the device changes with respect to time for example the pl that i said like that's the amount of photons that are coming out and the photons the pl is like you know the it's a reaction between the or rather recombination between the electron and the pole so it depends upon the product of the carrier densities that is the np product so if you see the pl varies as a particular rate then that what that tells you is that okay the product of the carrier densities is varying as per a particular trend but on the other hand if you are using this pump and the probe spectroscopy and then if you are looking at the properties of the probe signal under that specific conditions then it would tell you how the majority carrier density is changing because the majority carrier is like you know could be the one that is contributing more to us the absorption of the probe <clears throat> so one can use like you know, one can use such spectroscopic techniques by which you may modulate the carrier density inside the device and you wait you look at the transients by which the carrier density is changed with respect to time and the signature of that could be embedded in the transmitter signal or even the the pl signal so this is a well established technology uh, several variations i said like you know, for example pr is there steady state transient and then the uh, other uh, pump probe spectroscopy like you know one would be looking at the transient absorption diffuse reflectivity and several class but then the underlying point is that the resultant signal that you are like you know appropriately you are looking at could be dominated by the variable the, the dominant carrier density so by looking into that you would be able to see how the dominant carrier density would be varying inside the device when you excite it when you give a pulsed excitation and uh, <clears throat> if you look at the literature like you know as i mentioned this is a very well established technology several groups would be doing this and the way it is being like you know try uh, and then it's not that like you, know, you do the experiment okay the, you do the experiment and then you might be getting a trend like this with respect to time okay the transient absorption could be <clears throat> showing a decaying trend you may change the incident photon flux and then you would be getting a set of characteristics uh, well uh, getting the results is one part and then uh, the associated part is that like you know how one would make sense of these results and how one would in fact infer what are the relevant parameters that are associated with respect to the recombination phenomena right so on the second part i think i am running out of time okay so i'll, I'll go rather quick so how much more time do i have 10 more minutes how much 10 more minutes sir 10 more minutes okay so the relevant equation that is being used to understand this is the like you know it's a equation by which the 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 carrier density varies as like you know you are, would be having a first order first order term which is due to the trapezoidal recombination then there's a second order term which is, might be due to the ready to recombination and there is a third order term which is like you know due to the auger recombination and then this equation is like you know typically solved in part and then one can infer some uh, <coughs> insights so for the first part if there is a uh, proportional to the if the linear term is the dominant one you would under uh, you would see that the n would be varying exponentially with respect to time and then you would be seeing like you know you you might see a decreasing trend as an exponential decay like you know since the all these signals are proportional to n so if you are see if the n is expected to vary exponentially with respect to time okay then the absorption spectroscopy could also vary exponentially with respect to time and on the other hand if the second order term is the dominant one then you would see that the n would be varying as 1 upon t and that is a far far like you know dramatic reduction and then like you know for some of these curves you can see that there is a <clears throat> there is a rapid reduction at the initial phase followed by a long tail so this is the typical way by which like in this uh, phenomena or like you now these parameters are being back extracted in literature and using this like you know you one would be discretizing this in uh, several different regions and then people back extract the parameters and the numbers that one get typically are of the order of this say for example the k1 is of the order of 10 power 5 10 power 6 the k2 is of the order of 10 power minus 10 10 power minus 11 and the k3 is of the order of 10 power minus 28 minus 30 now you can see that like in you know, between these three parameters like you know the, the scale are uh, in fact like you know somewhat astronomical right one is 10 power 6 the other is 10 power minus 20 and the other is 10 power minus 29 so between k1 and k3 the the, the scale changes by almost 35 orders of magnitude and so it's remarkable that like you know, people can back extract these parameters from that okay so given this prevalent <coughs> uh, analysis 
I tried to sort of you know revisit some of these experimental results and collected data like this. And then instead of like you know plotting them on a so you can see that all of these plots are on a linear x versus y scheme or a y versus x scheme. Right? I plotted them in a different format. For example, this is like you know a bunch of results which are now plotted with the y-axis being linear and the x-axis being is in the log scale. So you can see that there is a, a, a it shows a different trend. All of them are straight lines on a linear versus log x. Okay, and that is not the uh, exponential trend. And there are even more surprises. Some other set of results, in fact, showed that linear trend on a log log scale. So this, <clears throat> what this indicate is that even though these all of these curves might look monotonically decreasing, these are not exponentials. These are, for example, the top panel shows that these are logarithmic variation, and the bottom side shows that these are like you know power law decreases. And all of these decreases, if you just merely plot them on a uh, linear linear plot may look monotonically decreasing. You may fit exponentials to that, back extract parameters, and then make whatever claims about that data. But in reality, the underlying trends and the underlying physics is like you know, something completely different, and you would be missing them by a huge margin. So <clears throat> the main uh, one of the main aspects that I wanted to convey is that just because you see a decreasing trend, that doesn't mean that your life is simple. That doesn't mean that the underlying curve is exponential. You have to check plot it in the appropriate manner and make sure that there is an exponential or not before you go further and doing an analysis which is like you know corresponding to the exponential trend okay so these non-exponential trends can be understood but then not by this formalism this formalism which is like you know prevalent in the the literature gives you only exponential or like you know one upon t or so it doesn't give you a power law with a uh, exponent which is different from minus one or it doesn't even predict uh, logarithmic trends which one can do by uh, starting with the description of the recombination process in a slightly more elaborate manner. So you have to consider like you know, how the electrons are being captured, they emit, and similarly the uh, holes are also being captured and emitted at the <coughs> trap level. And this is like, you know, this is the uh, basic formalism that you would have seen in many of the undergraduate courses and all, uh, at, at least in the electrical engineering departments, maybe in physics and chemistry, it's sort of, you know, they might rely on this uh, simpler description, which is, uh, which is definitely simple because of like, you know, uh, you can see that like you know if you the appropriate expressions are the ones that are written at the bottom with all the terms written on that and uh, solving that is like not so easy but then the other one could give you easy solutions okay so if you do that and then if you try to then uh, account for the trap distributions whether it's uniform distribution or exponential band tail distributions and then account for the fact that okay so this uh, trapping might happen like you know and then the traps might get filled uh, with respect to time but then uh, when the pulse is off, so the, during the pulse on period, the traps would be getting filled. And during the pulse off period, these traps would excite back to the conduction band and then they would recombine. So the, the decaying transient that you are going to see need not be limited by the recombination process, but it could be limited by the emission from the trap. And once you account for that, uh, and the fact that the trap emission, like, you know, the, the deeper the trap, it takes more time for it to emit. So once you account for that, you could do a little bit of math and then like, you know, uh, show that <clears throat> under uniform distribution of traps, what you would expect is that the majority carrier density would vary with respect to the logarithm, uh, logarithm of the time, right? And then the numerical simulations, in fact, indeed reproduce that trend. And those trends are seen in several experiments also, right? So these experiments were otherwise like, you know, interpreted in terms of exponentials, but uh, then that's not the case. These are essentially due to uh, emission limited response of uniform distribution of traps. And if you consider some other trap distribution, for example, exponential band tail states, which is being shown here, like you know, this is a co common <coughs> observation in uh, many of the perovskite materials that you would be having this Urbach tails. And if you do the corresponding analysis for that, in this case, you will find that the majority carrier density would follow a power law with respect to time with a unique uh, exponent. And this exponent is different from one. And like, you know, so there are several such experiments, like, you know, which indicate uh, that there is a power exponent which is different from one. Okay, so uh, one may repeat it for like, you know, pulse mode and other things which I may skip. And then let me directly come to the conclusion that characterization of the recombination phenomena is very important. And it's very important that you do that even at a material level. But then uh, if you read literature, almost every other paper that you would see would be relying on some form of this equation. Like, you know, uh, to back extract the recombination parameters, they may not be appropriate, right? You have to first respect the data, see the data, what the what are the trends in the data, and then do not have an a priori assumption that 
the every monotonic trend that you would see is an exponential and then you can you can fit and get the the k1 k2s and the k3s you may get values but then uh, th that may be uh, irrelevant in the sense that like you know the underlying physical mechanism could be something different okay so with that i stop uh, 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 the so the bottom line message is that like for those who are doing experiments the fact that there is a simple analytical theory available does not mean that like you know all that you would see can be explained by the simple model respect the data plot the data in the appropriate manner and start with the uh, the, the basic models and try to understand like you know what would be the the governing physical mechanism and with that like you know you would be able to understand like you know what are the various processes that are <clears throat> that are dominating your particular device and you can then come back optimize and then uh, aim for a better device okay thank you so i have almost uh, completed in time i had to rush through uh, some parts of the the presentation uh, but then um, i assume that like you know there might be uh, enough time for uh, uh, a couple of questions o otherwise like you know uh, i know that there are like other speakers who are like you know plan to schedule it right away in case any of you want to contact me uh, you may write back to me uh, uh, if if you need uh, clarifications on any of the topics that i have discussed so far thank you Thank you, Professor Pradeep, uh, for an enlightening lecture, the lecture on the physics and characterization of perovskite solar cells. And sorry for the inconvenience caused with the mic. And uh, now we'll take some questions. So first question is how OGL limit is different from short, shortly Cauchier limit for solar cells. Okay, so the the Shockley Cauchier limit considers only the radiative recombination. Okay, so you you see that like you know that is that. Uh, k square k2 n square and other things and the oj limit means like you know, we are considering one more recombination mechanism more the recombination the efficiencies would come down so if you uh, for example like you know the typical maximum efficiency that you could get under the radiative limit would be of the order of say 33 percentage or so is the shockley coaster limit if you consider the appropriate oj recombination mechanism that numbers would come down to for example for crystalline silicon it would be close to 30 percentage or so so uh, you, you could do a similar analysis. You need to know what is the fundamental OJ recombination coefficient. And with that, like, you know, the, the, the limits can be updated. So Shockley Quester by definition, or uh, if you go back to that original paper of the 1961 or 63, considered only ready to recombination as the fundamental mechanism. With OJ recombination uh, limit, like, you know, one has to consider, in addition to the Shockley, the ready to recombination, you have to consider the OJ recombination as well. Thank you, sir. Next question is: Is there any is there a quantum confined stack star effect happening with MSM injection? Um, uh, not much, but also like you know these devices like you know the uh, the ones that I had described are like, essentially macro scale devices, uh, like you know the thicknesses are several uh, hundreds of nanometers and other things. So uh, almost everything uh, can be understood in terms of like you know a semi classical effects itself. Yes, sir. So next is which kind of material can be selected for HDL and EDL? What is the important factor uh, which can affect their performance? But the piezoelectric materials can be chosen as the HDL and ETL. Th that's the question, right? Uh, well, I'm not sure how piezoelectricity is going to. Kind of material can be selected. Yeah, is if I have heard it correctly, well, I'm not sure how piezoelectricity is going to help this. Uh, I might have to uh, think about that. Okay. Now one more question. Uh, perovskite materials are synthesized to purchase and uh, deposited. What is the maximum efficiency of perovskite solar cells? Uh, could, you, could you repeat that again? I missed out the initial part. Uh, the materials are purchased, synthesized to uh, Deposited. What is the maximum efficiency of perovskite solar cells? That's a general question. Material synthesized. Uh, again, I missed out one or two. So the maximum efficiency of like you know perovskite solar cells are close to 26 percentage or so. So that uh, that particular fine aspect that you asked, like you know, I missed out. Like you, know, you, you may kindly write to me. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, uh, for sharing your expertise with us. We will move on. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you uh, for listening to me. Uh, there are many questions. 
Yeah, you, you may uh, uh, write back to me. Okay. Thank you. What is Spencer a question to write uh, in the chat box? Okay, so, so, so I will try to answer them, few, few of them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now we'll move to the next technical talk. This is Hydric for Photovoltaics and Beyond by Professor Munajit Park from IIT Roorkee. Professor Munajit Park is an associate professor in the Department of Physics and an adjunct faculty in the Center for Nanotechnology at the Indian Institute of Technology, Roorkee, India. He completed his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Jagadpur University and a master's in physics from the University of Pune uh, in 2003 and 2006, respectively. In 2011, he completed his PhD from JNCSR in the field of material science. He then went on to do postdoc work at the University of Massachusetts, USA, and Lund University, Sweden, before joining IIT University in 2016. Professor Bob has a broad range of expertise from device fabrication to various characterizations, including theoretical modeling and simulation. Its research interest into organic electronics and hydroperoxide based material for energy harvesting and storage. He has taught several courses related to energy and nanotechnology for undergraduate students and postgraduate students at IIT Roorkee. In his talk, Professor Bar will discuss the fundamentals of iron migration in hybrid allied peroxides and strategies to reduce it. He will also explore the potential applications of these materials in next time. Smart devices and high energy density supercapacitors. We are excited to hear from Professor Bob and learn more about the latest developments in hybrid peroxides. Without further ado, just welcome Professor Manojit Bob to the virtual stage. Sir, please. Uh, uh, so, uh, is my screen uh, visible? Yes, is sir. screen visible or am I audible? Yes, yes sir. Yes. Okay, okay. So let me go to presentation mode. Uh, can you see my uh, screen? Uh, it's presentation now? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, so screen okay. is visible. Uh, you can type the uh, sharing screen, screen option at the bottom. Please okay. click hide. I can hide Thank it. Right? Okay. okay, fine, fine. Thank you. Fine. So, um, first of all, uh, uh, thank you for this invitation, and it's nice to uh, talk about some of my uh, recent work. And I'd like to uh, thank Professor uh, Pradeep Naya for giving nice um, uh, introduction to photophysics and device physics. So my job would be much simpler. So uh, my research group uh, at Arise uh, IIT Roorkee currently focusing on uh, these three major areas. Uh, uh, basically, perovskite light, emit light emitting diode, uh, large area perovskite solar cells, and uh, photo. Uh, Electrochemistry of uh, perovskite based materials. Uh, today's talk mostly focused will be uh, these these uh, areas like uh, energy uh, storage, water splitting, CO2. So uh, I'll, I'll try to focus on the energy storage. And uh, because this is a part of a nano um, uh, nan uh, nanotechnology um, conference, so I'll try to uh, summarize some of the perovskite based nanomaterials and uh, their applications. So uh, uh, we have already uh, got some idea about why perovskites are so important. So if you uh, just look at this comparison chart, uh, if, you, if you look at these perovskite materials, they're all uh, very good, like green representing very uh, uh, good in terms of their uh, uh, efficiency, raw material cost, fabrication cost, energy payback period. But where we are lacking is mostly the stability part. So uh, my initial part of my talk will be focused on the stability of these perovskites. So uh, I think Professor Nair has already given the uh, uh, idea of uh, perovskite materials. So uh, I'll try to focus the simplest perovskites, that the MAPI perovskites. And definitely you can have all these perovskite materials with, uh, uh, like you can tune the band gap from very wide band gap to very narrow, narrow band gap, depending on the decomposition and so on. So let us start. So my journey started like uh, 2014 when I was a postdoc at uh, UMass. So uh, that time we started to just fabricate the perovskite device and uh, made a device efficiency of 13%. I mean, that time probably it is still okay. So nowadays this efficiency has gone beyond 26%. Uh, but surprisingly, when we try to measure the efficiency of devices, we realized that over a period of time, the device actually degrades. So if you look at their efficiency, uh, this is the uh, exposed hour. 
so uh, the uh, efficiency decrease but when you keep the device in a dark for say 10 to 15 minutes there is little bit of increase in the efficiency so although the uh, reversibility is not uh, quite 100% but there is some sort of reversible uh, uh, phenomena we have observed at that time now uh, why there is a reversibility and what is the impact so to understand we uh, did uh, impedance spectroscopy so my focus will be mostly the impedance spectroscopy to understand the uh, of uh, the device physics and where we are lacking so if you look at the uh, perovskite uh, like impedance curve so impedance means you just apply a ac uh, voltage measure the ac current and you switch your frequency from very low frequency to very high frequency and then you plot the uh, real component of the impedance versus the imaginary component of your impedance it it, it looks like this so this is called the nyquist plot now we try to understand this impedance curve by different model. So uh, this part is basically your high frequency component and this part is coming from the low frequency component. So we try to fit these model with the different uh, equivalent circuits. Uh, we initially started with simple RC model. It did not fit well. Then we change it to um, say uh, uh, constant phase element for high frequency and uh, the low frequency. Uh, to some extent it's better, but still uh, it is not completely 100%. Then we move to the uh, war bar, which represents kind of like mass transfer or ion transfer. And that's what we realized that these low frequency component is not because of some sort of a capacity effect, rather it comes some sort of ion migration. And that is the first uh, experimental evidence of ion migration in halide perovskites. So that time it probably took uh, uh, quite a long time to establish this concept, but later on, a lot of group uh, experimentally as well as theoretically proven that in halide perovskites we have two types of uh, charge transport. One is basically the, uh, the high frequency charge transport, that's the electronic transport, and then you have the low frequency transport, which is basically the ionic transport. And uh, depending on the nature of the perovskites, uh, these two parameters can be uh, tunable. Like you can tune the electronic transport as well as you can tune the uh, ionic transport. But what is the consequence of this ionic transport on the device stability? So if you look at this different composition and you do the temperature dependent study and try to find out the activation barrier for ions, you realize that the MAPI has the lowest activation uh, energy. So it, it degrades much faster compared to the mixed halide or uh, uh, mixed cation perovskites. Like we have tried uh, MAFA, we have tried FA. So normally MAFA or FA is slightly uh, better stable compared to the uh, MAPI film. And uh, we also try to understand by different light source. We have used, say, light, uh, light emitting diode, LED, which do not have the infrared component. We have tried M1.5 with a um, uh, filter. So when you try to uh, aim 1.5 with the filter, so uh, the efficiency actually, um, so normally like solar simulator, it, it drops. But if you use some sort of a filter, actually uh, the efficiency becomes more and more stable. So the understanding, to understand that, we did the temperature de dependent XRD under light and under dark condition. So at room temperature, or dark or LED, uh, uh, LED uh, illumination, you get these, the black one. And when you heat it around 45 to 50 degrees centigrade, you do see there is a shift in the peak position, which indicates that the lattice, uh, uh, there is a lattice expansion, basically. And also, uh, it goes from, say, uh, tetragonal phase. So this tetragonal peak here actually disappears. So this tetragonal phase actually disappears and goes to cubic phase. We did uh, these measurement on three different uh, perovskites. One is MAPI, other one is uh, FAPI, and then the mixed methyl, uh, methyl ammonium permanganate uh, uh, iodide perovskite. So these are three different uh, crystal structures. When you heat, the, uh, heat them, you see there is a volume change for the MAPI is the highest, other two are uh, to some extent in between. And most surprisingly, what we see that uh, MAPI actually degrades much faster compared to the other two uh, 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 samples. So the hypothesis is uh, when you uh, basically uh, heat the sample and pull it back, it, it is kind of a reversible process. So there is a lattice expansion and then 
uh, the lattice axial strings. But then when you heat it and then shine light, what happens is this counterant, which is sitting here, methyl ammonium or maybe like permobilinium. So this uh, uh, cation actually goes out and this three-dimensional structure collapses to two-dimensional structure. So you start to see this lead peak uh, uh, appearing here. So it is kind of a like uh, hypothesis, we can say, although like this schematic is not exact, but this is just to give you idea that when you sign uh, light with heat, so this, this is the data, like with heat actually it gets smooth. So when you sign light and heat, uh, this, this lattice actually expand and uh, some of the uh, counter and which are uh, sitting inside actually goes out. So if you somehow prevent this ion migration from this uh, uh, the lattice, the device could be mo much more stable. So we'll come to that point, what are the other consequences of this ion migration and so on. So this is the hypothesis. You have a lattice, when you heat it with in, uh, under light, uh, the lattice actually expands. That's kind of like lattice breathing you can call. And then this counter and which is sitting, uh, this cation sitting inside, the case actually goes out because the activation barrier goes down. Now it has a, a consequence on the device physics as well. So we can think about uh, uh, two potential which are normally happens in any uh, semiconductor junctions. One is your built-in potential. The moment you have this uh, either uh, say a PN junction or a, a, MSM junction. So you have the built-in potential around this uh, junction. And then when you show Sorry, your mic is muted. But I did not. Yeah, it's the same thing happening. Okay. So now it's fine. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, so uh, when when you uh, look at these uh, the devices, you have this uh, potential, you have the built-in potential, and at the same time you have the voltage which is generated due to the migration of these ions. So you have three potential. Uh, uh, basically competing to each other. And depending on the applied potential, applied voltage, these can play around like this. So you will have kind of like inflation point where this net potential goes to minima and then it starts to rise again. So the whole device dynamics play around with these three potentials here. Now, this can affect the overall of uh, the uh, uh, barber impedance as the device degrades. It can also create some sort of a, uh, uh, like here you can see the, uh, the this, this, this is the diffusion coefficient of ions. So as you increase the voltage, the diffusion coefficient also increases. That means uh, the ions are uh, uh, migrating much, much faster. And ionic conductivity at the same time, you can see the ionic conductivity is also increasing. And if you look at the, uh, the war bar impedance, it actually decreases when the device decreases. So it means, you uh, introduce more and more defects in the, uh, into the systems, more and goes out, there will be more defects, there will be more ion migration. So it, it is kind of like uh, uh, sort of like a positive feedback kind of systems which accelerates over a period of time and then device degrades much, much more uh, faster. So the idea is definitely if you can somehow arrest these ion migration or you can manipulate these ion migration in different ways, you can stabilize to some extent. I mean, not uh, not necessary that it will be perfectly stable, but to some extent, you can stabilize uh, these devices. Now, to uh, manipulate these kind of ion migration, what we did, we uh, make a uh, mixed cation and mixed halide uh, samples. So here you can see MA, FA, and then you have a bromide and iodide at, the, at a three uh, uh, like uh, different com uh, combination. So the X can vary from 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 8, and 1. So you can see it goes from MABR, completely MABR, to MAFA, lead, bromine, iodine, some com uh, combination, uh, combination of that. Now, uh, I mean, definitely there are uh, uh, different uh, morphology. These are the AFM uh, images. You can see their morphology is also changing. So to understand uh, more precisely how the impedance uh, uh, like imp impedance spectroscopy looks like, 
we took two composition, which is 0.6 and 0 0.8, having similar roughness. Definitely, when you try to uh, study the impedance spectroscopy, these are very specific to the interface as well as the bulk. So if the interface is not same, then definitely the uh, the one-to-one -one correspondence or one-to-one -one comparison would be difficult. So to avoid this kind of a discrepancy, we uh, chose two composition, which is uh, like x is equal to 0.6 and 0.8. Now, what is the effect? So when you try to uh, understand this impedance spectroscopy, we uh, th this is the Nyquist plot of these two composition. It's a simple uh, structures. We have uh, bottom ITO, perovskites, and uh, counter electrode uh, as uh, uh, silver. So uh, this this simple structure actually it's definitely it's not a solar cell because it does not have the SCL or ETL. To just to study the materials, we have used metal semicon uh, semiconductor that's the perovskites and metal uh, junction. Now from this impedance spectroscopy, we can calculate few parameters. One is called the uh, tan phi. And from the tan phi, you can uh, calculate the mobility term. And the, uh, uh, the uh, like uh, either we can uh, calculate the mobility or we can uh, plot the uh, diffusion coefficient, which is D. And we have done it for different temperature from say 30 degrees centigrade to uh, 60 degrees centigrade, although the temperature range is not uh, quite large, but it is good enough to study the ion minus and definitely if you go to beyond certain temperature there will be a lot more effect which can uh, due to the structural change and other things so you don't want to go to that level and also if you go to the lower temperature there will be another uh, uh, phase change so it can again complicate things so this range is quite good enough to understand the electronic and ionic behavior now interestingly if you look at this activation barrier for these two sample M mcmh there's some uh, Mixed cation, mixed halide, uh, x is equal to 0.6 and x equal to 0.8. And we plotted this diffusion coefficient as a function of uh, 1000 by t. So it, it shows basically the RNA step behavior. And we can calculate the activation energy barrier, which is uh, 0.36 eV. And this case is 0.47 eV. Now it means that uh, the uh, this one, this uh, MCMH06, has a lower activation than the uh, MCMH08. So that means the MCMH08 supposed to have more stable because their activation barrier is higher. So the ion migration will definitely will be lower compared to the MCMH06. So to some extent, although like this, this activation energy is still comparable to uh, MAPI film, but it's not uh, drastically high of say beyond one EV or something. So it will still have a lot of ion migration. But what uh, uh, take home message is that if you uh, change the mixed cation to mixed halide, you can manipulate the ion transport in these devices. And uh, we try to understand the ion uh, conductivity. So we plot the uh, uh, conductivity versus frequency curve for all these devices at all uh, different temperature. The first one is MCMH06, and uh, that's at 30 degrees centigrade, and this is at 60 degrees centigrade. So these are uh, different regime you can see. So uh, N is equal to 0.5, uh, like when this slope is greater than uh, uh, zero, that called the uh, Johnson power law uh, behavior. And then it can go to the super linear power law behavior. But uh, in, in general, you can get a kind of a flat regime, which is not, uh, not at, uh, I mean, which is known as the nearly constant loss. So uh, this plateau actually not visible uh, most of this uh, graph here. So these are mostly the Johnson power law behavior. And uh, this, uh, the uh, uh, SPL regime, that's the superlinear power law regime, has a two different kinetics. So uh, if you look at this MCMH uh, uh, as a function of temperature, you can see the uh, the exponent, this SPL exponent actually goes high. It go, goes from 1.2 to 1.4 as the temperature increases. Whereas this MCMH06, uh, this goes from say 1.34 to uh, 33342, uh, it goes to like 1.2. So that means their uh, high frequency behavior is not identical. Now, what, why, uh, because there's not much of change except the uh, bromide to halide 
composition, right? And Ma to Fa composition. So why there is a uh, change? That can be understood based on the the kind of backend seat has and the kind of interaction you have. So in first cases, you have a lot of um, uh, like AP plus vacancies. You can see like these are all AP plus. There are some AP plus vacancies. And then definitely the, there is a, a very strong interaction between FA and iodine. So that will have a much stronger interaction compared to MA and bromine. So depending on these two conditions, you can have one is the uh, low, uh, low applied bias regime, one is the high applied bias regime. You can see the temperature dependent is exactly opposite. And that is also reflected in the high frequency range as well. So that means the uh, the nature of vacancy, whether the uh, cation vacancy or whether it is the uh, halide vacancy and what kind of halide vacancy, whether it's a bromide vacancy or iodide vacancy, that plays a crucial role uh, in determining the uh, AC ionic conductivity in these devices. So it's very uh, specific, not necessary that all the halide uh, perovskite will behave similarly because it, it all depends on the uh, the vacancy uh, sites and uh, what kind of vacancy we are looking at. Now, to summarize this first part, uh, what we have understood that the photo-induced ion migration is the one of the key problem in perovskite solar cells, because uh, the moment uh, these ions actually migrating through the active layers, sometimes this uh, the whole structure actually collapses to the lead iodide or lead halide structures, which uh, in turn uh, give you very poor uh, photoconversion efficiency. Now, this ion migration can uh, be reduced by reducing the operating temperature. Definitely, if you cool down, you, you are uh, looking at a different uh, uh, phase or you are trying to arrest a lot of the uh, ion which is migrating through, then you can, uh, to some extent, stabilize this uh, structure. The electronic transport can be modified due to the electron ion interactions because, as I said, uh, this, uh, 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 these ion migrations are coupled with the electrons, not, not necessary that. Uh, uh, both the electron and hole are coupled, but to some extent, electron hole coupled with the, the vacancy sites. And that's what this ion migration and uh, the uh, electronic transport, they are coupled. And that leads to a lot of anomalous behavior, which again, we'll be discussing, for example, like the hysteresis in perovskite materials and so on. Now, the interaction between A-side cation and X-side halide ion play a crucial load in determining the ionic conductivity in mixed halide uh, mixed uh, 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 mixed cation, mixed halide perovskite materials. So um, the bottom line is a lot of high efficiency and stable devices are now uh, uh, made by uh, doing the compositional engineering. Compositional engineering means you can use say uh, two different types of cations, or sometimes like people are using triple cations to uh, play with these electronic ionic transport, and uh, to some extent you can uh, stabilize these uh, devices. Now, the next part is most uh, uh, exciting to me because this is slightly different from the so-called uh, the uh, solar cell community and uh, light emitting diode communities because periscates are being widely used in these two areas. Now, uh, maybe like uh, five, six years back, actually, this project we started, we tried to understand what happened if we make this periscite and uh, uh, rather than having a solid electrode, can we uh, make a junction of electrolyte? And what happened to the uh, junction? So definitely the challenge is like, a lot of periscates are unstable in aqueous electrolytes, so we cannot use the aqueous electrolyte. So we have figured out some of the electrolytes, which are uh, normally soluble in say, dichloromethane and uh, some other uh, uh, anti-solvents. And uh, then we can make a junction of it. So although these, these junctions are not very stable, but this can give you some idea that when you have this perovskite electrolyte interface, uh, not necessary that you will have a very good electron transfer from the perovskite to the uh, electrolyte. So what will happen is uh, this junction will sometimes uh, uh, behave like a blocking layer. So you will have a lot of capacitance, so which is basically represented by the Helmholtz capacitance. So, and then you have the Chapman in the electrolyte side. Now, when you do the uh, uh, the mod sort key plot, one over C square versus potential, and we did it from, say, uh, uh, negative voltage to the positive voltage or positive voltage to the negative voltage, we see two different types of behavior. 
So this junction clearly says that uh, if you if you do this scan, it gives you some sort of like N-type semiconducting behavior. Whereas if you do this scan, it gives you P-type semiconducting behavior. So in other we can say that these uh, materials are kind of ambipolar, but you can selectively make it either P-type or N-type depending on the history it has. So it's the pre-bias which gives you either P-type behavior or N-type behavior in these materials. Now, what is the effect of that? So definitely uh, this can uh, alter this uh, surface polarization. So if you look at this low frequency component in um, a solid state device where you have the uh, uh, metal or metal electrode or STL, uh, you have uh, like charge transfer. So normally there is a uh, very strong polarization at the interface. So you have all this ion piling up in the uh, perovskite sets, for example, like a bit, and there is a bromide which can form some kind of like dipole. And these dipolar behavior actually gives you kind of like low frequency negative capacitance in solid state devices. Like a lot of uh, report in the literature will see the negative capacitance in perovskite materials. And it, uh, it could be solar cell, it could be LED. And that comes because of uh, this uh, surface polarization, which uh, slow down the uh, uh, tangent current. Now, this can be absent in uh, electrolyte devices because it, it forms a very strong uh, polarization field. So this polarization of electrolyte uh, basically suppress the uh, perovskite polarization here. So you don't see too much of surface polarization, right? Unless uh, you have a solid state where you have the electron transport, only the ions are stuck here. And that's what you get the polarization. But here, electrons are also not going to the electrolyte side. So that can passivate the interface. And you can have very strong uh, bending around the uh, interface. And that uh, leads to no polarization around the interface here on this side. So that definitely, this side capacity will be much higher. But because of this, uh, uh, the more or less flat band here, you don't get much polarization here. So that is the consequence. And that's what. In um, uh, electrolyte-based devices, you don't see this inductive effect or the uh, negative capacitance in the step of uh, devices. Now, what is the effect? So definitely solid-state device, you get negative capacitance, you get anomalous behavior. But in uh, uh, liquid uh, electrolyte uh, devices, you don't see that kind of anomalous behavior here, like which is present here. You don't see here, or also at high frequency, uh, at low frequency, you get only the capacitive effect. There's no negative capacitance. Like this, this actually goes down. Right? So when you try to uh, measure the capacitance, so you don't see that. So why we are so interested in this uh, type of uh, geometry? Because these materials are normally uh, uh, very high ionic conductivity as well as electronic conductivity at the same time. Now, what is the consequence? So if you have a material which is a very good ionic and electronic conductor or mixed conductor, that should uh, be a very good candidate for the energy storage, such as like supercapacitor. So that's what we uh, started doing this project. So this is the typical uh, the device structures. So you take normally perovskite uh, single crystals and you grind them uh, to make it kind of like fine powder. And uh, to some extent, to balance the electronic and ionic uh, transport, you can add a little bit of carbon. I mean, without carbon also, it can work. But adding carbon actually uh, stabilizes this uh, um, uh, porous uh, electrode structure. And to make a better quality uh, film or porous film, you can add a binder because ultimately you have to uh, make the electrode on the graphite sheet. So this is the uh, schematic. You uh, make the perovskite powder, add carbon black, mix them uh, very well and then uh, add a little bit of uh, PVDF and uh, uh, basically make a kind of a slurry in uh, NMP and then uh, slurry can be uh, brass coated on this graphite electrode, graphite set to make this electrode. So we have compared uh, two different type of uh, uh, supercapacitors or other I would say like one is kind of a capacitor other is kind of a supercapacitor. So this is the thin film. Thin film definitely does not have the porous uh, interface. That's very compact uh, uh, surface. So thin film do not show much higher capacitance. You can see this is somewhere in like uh, 40 uh, microfarad uh, per centimeter square. That's the real capacitance. But if you make the porous structure, 
it it goes up to like uh, 80 millifarad. So you can see like almost 2000 times jump. Oh, audible? Yes, sir. Yeah. So uh, as you can see, almost like uh, 2000 uh, times jump in the uh, aerial capacitance here. Now, this pore, because of this porous structure, definitely uh, you have a lot of ion uh, accumulation at the interface, which can give you much higher capacity than the thin film. And also, if you look at their uh, the, the stability, uh, thin film device actually degrades much, much faster. Whereas these porous structures can have much more stable. Uh, so, this is the Columbic efficiency up to 1500 cycles, it's almost like 91%. And if you look at the uh, uh, the capacity retention, it's almost like 97%. So it's quite stable up to 1500 cycle. Although like in supercapacitors, people talk about like 50,000 and beyond. Although, I mean, these devices are definitely not that stable compared to the carbon base or other inorganic uh, perovskite materials which are used in supercapacitors. But it is a beginning and definitely there are some other advantages we'll be talking about in coming slides. Now, what is the consequence of this ion in perovskites? which uh, uh, or like how we understand this charge transport in these materials. So if you take uh, these two uh, uh, sample here, one is the uh, porous structure, which we have made by uh, the uh, making the slurry, and this is the thin film. So thin film definitely you don't have uh, too much of surface. So it will have only the EDLC type. And if you look at the B parameter, so normally uh, from the B parameter, you can calculate the, um, the cap capacitance, whether it is uh, electric double layer type or pseudo capacitance type. So in porous structure, you see that uh, it, it goes to um, uh, double layer type, like uh, EDLC2, the, to some extent, um, uh, uh, diffusion type or pseudo type. Whereas for thin pin, you don't see that. It is always like capacitive, like or EDLC type mechanism, because there's not much of uh, room to um, uh, ion to intercalate or the diffusing. And also, if you change the uh, 3D perovskites to 2D, so 2D means you have a very bulky cation sitting in between these layers. So whenever you have this bulky cation sitting here, it indirectly uh, inhibit the ion migration through these layers. So in other way, you can say that uh, dimensional engineering can reduce the ion migration in perovskite, and that's what a lot of new research has been emerged that you make kind of like heterostructure of 3D, 2D, and you can make a very stable uh, perovskite solar cells because this 2D does not allow the uh, uh, ion migration. But in uh, 3D, definitely have a lot of uh, defects and you have a lot of ion migration, which indirectly uh, increase the charge storage capacity, but uh, the device efficiency decreased. So 2D, generally you don't see this anomalous behavior. Normally this B value is supposed to be one, but in 3D, it goes to very high because of this ionic field, which modulate the actual field. So to understand this, probably uh, uh, this is not the best place because this uh, to some, uh, I mean, uh, too much, um, what do you call, uh, mechanism are there. So those who are interested, definitely I can discuss in more details. But uh, to uh, the take home message is if you have a 3D materials that has an internal field which modify the actual uh, applied field and that can change the B parameter beyond one. I mean, normally any, any semiconductor, you, you take supercapacitor or any uh, conducting material, you make a supercapacitor, it's supposed to be within one to 0.5. But in perovskites, what uh, this kind of anomalous behavior we have object, that's only because this ionic field modified the, uh, the actual field. And you can see the uh, uh, normally in 3D you have a capacitive at low field and then high field, uh, it will be mostly the uh, diffusion limited, but it's much lower. Whereas this 2D, you can see this B parameter is always less than one. And uh, it goes from 0.8 to 0.2. So it's mostly the diffusion limited. That is the uh, reason. And that because the internal field is not there in 2D material. Now, there is another important aspect of uh, this kind of uh, semiconductors, because you know the perovskite is very good uh, optoelectronic materials, so it can absorb visible light. Now, can we make kind of a uh, supercapacitor which can 
harvest light and store at the same time which is known as the photo rechargeable supercapacitor and perovskite is one probably the first time we have demonstrated uh, it can uh, harvest light and store energy at the same time so that uh, opens up uh, the opportunity for upgrade photovoltaic applications so this is the set of data you can see uh, this is the dark and this is under illumination so under illumination the capacity is uh, actually increased and this is actually as a function of carbon uh, percentage you can see as the carbon percentage increases the uh, overall capacitance increases but the photocapacitance part actually decreases so there is a optimum composition so this is 25% uh, carbon you don't see uh, photocapacitance here so there is a optimum composition around, around like 10 to 15% where you get the maximum photo charging but beyond that you don't get so it's all about uh, playing with the electronic and ionic transport in this uh, uh, electron material so there is a balanced electronic and ionic transport to some extent you get the photo uh, charging but if the electronic transport becomes superior compared to the ionic transport you don't get the uh, photo charging so the photo charging needs this ion migration so without ion migration you will not get this photo charging and that's what we propose kind of a model this is the 5% carbon where you see the photo uh, charging where you have this electron ion coupling still present but if you go to the 25% carbon the uh, carbon percentage is good enough to uh, extract all these electrons so once this electron goes to the carbon phase there is no coupling of ions and electrons in the perovskite phase you can see the perovskite phase is much uh, less here so the ions are sort of like stuck they don't move too much and also they are not coupled with the electron so you don't get the photo charging here so that means to get a photo charging you need a, a proper balance of electron and ion in both the devices so this is the uh, photo charging uh, device you can see uh, under light it, it gives you a kind of potential around 0.3 that is our first trial definitely we have improved the overall performance so we'll uh, show again and uh, this is the photo energy density so we can make like 160 milliwatt uh, per kg although these these numbers are not very Uh, exciting number but it looks very promising because you can get a single device uh, which can directly uh, harvest light and store energy in the same device and we try to uh, understand the stability from the uh, uh, x phase measurement so normally if you have little bit of lead zero component this actually uh, degrades the sample if you can uh, get rid of this lead zero by adding uh, carbon percentage like when, when you add a 25% carbon you see this lead zero is almost gone so this is without carbon so you have very strong lead zero peak this is 5% carbon you can still see this lead zero peak uh, present here a little bit and 25% there is no lead zero peak and uh, uh, so uh, c20 uh, uh, i'm like c5 you can see this bromine peak is gone so that means bromine has list out completely from the electrode so it, it the structure gets collapsed but uh, c25 you can see this bromine is still intact even after the measurement so that means these devices are stable but at the same time it doesn't show the photo charging and that can also be reflected uh, uh, if you look at these uh, perovskite peaks so this is a carbon peak don't uh, consider this strong peak here this is the carbon peak uh, but if you look at this uh, uh, 100 peak Uh, so here actually this 100 peak actually decreases and then you have this lead bromide peak appearing but in this case you have this 100 peak intact there is not much of change in the crystal structure so increasing carbon percentage stabilizes the uh, electrode materials but it decreases the uh, photo charging so it's a trade off between the photo charging and the stability and uh, this can also be uh, addressed by different ways like if you have a mixed alloy mixed carbon uh, perovskites Uh, the charge trapping may uh, kill the photo charging so uh, we have tried two different composition so this is a, uh, i mean uh, maybe to understand more uh, you can uh, go through this paper here so we have got here uh, the charging voltage up to beyond 1 volt which is quite similar to like photo uh, voltage of the solar cell but then if you have uh, like uh, demixing of halide like you have a iodide phase you have the bromide phase then this iodide phase basically become like a trap states and you don't see this photo charging here so this device is basically the this kind of like phase segregation moment you have this phase segregation you have a lot of charge trapping 
which do not give you the photo charging. So definitely a uh, lot of uh, photophysics has to be understood here because the charge generation, two charge transport, two charge storage. So these are three different process which are happening at three different time scale. Now, these materials are also good for uh, high efficiency supercapacitor. So these, these devices are not very efficient. So what we did, we changed the electrolyte from TBTF, TBPC to lithium based electrolyte. And lithium being a very small cation that can get intercalate into these uh, like tetrahedral hole and octahedral hole of this periscite material. So there are a lot of tetrahedral holes and octahedral holes in this periscite structure that this lithium can get intercalated. And that uh, can improve the stability as well as if you look at the performance of this uh, uh, like uh, lithium based supercapacitor, they are much more superior. In fact, we have uh, made the device which are uh, like able to uh, drive, say, uh, YOLO, green, even like some stacked device can uh, drive the white LED. That means you are getting voltage which is close to 3 volt. And uh, they are uh, very stable. Like these device can run up to like uh, uh, like uh, 2,500 cycles of like up to 5,000 cycles without much uh, uh, degradation in the device performance. And this is solid state device. So this electrolyte actually we have made kind of like thick gel which can be sandwiched between uh, these two electrolytes. Uh, the, the two electrolytes. And uh, these devices are also flexible. So uh, we have made it on, uh, say, uh, stainless steel substrate and graphite substrate. How much time I do have? I mean, 15 minutes. So we can also make uh, these uh, substrate on a flexible uh, substrate like stainless steel and graphite. And you can bend it like multiple times. You have done it like over 200 cycles, and they are quite stable. So definitely the uh, graphite substrate shows much more stable uh, performance than the stainless steel. Stainless steel definitely uh, it, it degrades. And one of the major reasons of degradation is the crack formation. Like uh, there may be some uh, material degradation, but at the same time, uh, this crack formation and delamination from the stainless steel uh, are the major, major cause of uh, the degradation in these supercapacitors. So more details can be seen here. So to summarize that we can uh, make a porous structure of periscite electrode and uh, uh, like if you make a porous structure, you can get almost 2000 times aerial capacitance and that's what we have made. Ionic conductivity in periscite actively plays a crucial role in charge storage. We have shown like uh, how charge storage in 2D periscites and 3D periscites can be changed. Uh, okay, this anomalous B value probably you need to understand more about it. And more interestingly, uh, these devices are also photo uh, rechargeable because the periscites are very good uh, photosensitizer, so that can directly harvest and store in a single device. Lithium ion based electrolytes perform much higher uh, efficiency than the uh, non lithium based electrolyte because lithium can intercalate into the periscite structures. These devices can be fabricated on flexible substrate because you can, you can uh, make uh, like lot of uh, flexible electronic devices are there which needs very quick uh, charging time for example like say um, uh, smart devices smart watch and all these things so these devices can be integrated into that uh, uh, smart, flexible electronics now the next uh, five to ten minutes probably i'll be talking about another aspect of periscites which is now uh, booming in uh, like next uh, like last five years i would say that is the uh, switching behavior because these periscite materials are highly uh, mixed conductor. Like we have electronic and ionic transport, and and uh, the device shows a lot of hysteresis, and that can be used as one of the uh, memory uh, devices, like uh, resistive switching. So uh, the simple structure could be you can take uh, electrode materials, could be like ITO, and then you make uh, the uh, periscites as a thick layer and then put a counter electrode. Now, when you apply bias between these two, you do have a lot of ion migration which are uh, stuck at the interfaces. So that ion migration, I mean, there are different mechanisms. In fact, uh, people have talked about the ion accumulation, people have talked about the, uh, like if you, if you take the silver, silver halide can be formed. People have talked about the, uh, the ion channel formation. And uh, if you use say, um, uh, in, in, in fact, silver can also diffuse into these periscite materials and make a filament. 
So there are different mechanisms to understand why this type of material shows this kind of uh, uh, memory effect. Now, based on the, uh, the IV cup, we can uh, see whether these, these switching behavior is based on the, uh, the filament formation or there is some sort of other mechanism happening in this uh, type of devices. Now, let us look at our device. So we also made uh, this ITO glass. We have made these uh, periscites, uh, this is MAPVBR3, and we deposited gold on top. So there is no other hole transporter or anything. And we try to understand this IV carb. What we see is when you shine light on it, so if you see this set voltage actually decreasing. So at different uh, light intensity, the set voltage is decreasing. And also, the if you look at the set the slope here, the way uh, the uh, IV is changing, that uh, increases up to a certain point and then uh, decreases. So we try to understand this behavior by looking at uh, this kind of a, like mechanism. What is the mechanism? So whenever you have this dark condition, you can think that there are a lot of ions, which are uh, uh, basically the uh, and vacancies, you can say like bromide vacancies and methyl, uh, methyl uh, ammonium. Now, when you shine uh, uh, light on it, so uh, so this side is increasing voltage, and this side is basically dark, and this side is light. So normally, it try to accumulate at these two. So moment you apply a little bit of voltage here, they try to accumulate uh, the, these two sides depending on the applied voltage. Now, same as like when dark, there is no voltage. You increase a little bit of voltage, there is an accumulation here, and then uh, this ants start to uh, move a little bit. And you uh, apply more and more voltage. You see uh, this filament actually start to increase. This side also start to increase. And uh, this iron actually uh, uh, try to move faster and faster. But definitely, it depends on the increasing voltage rate. Now, under light, because of the photo-induced voltage, there is already in build field, and then uh, these filaments start to form itself. And the ions are already uh, sort of mobile under light. So that means you can see that this state and this state is already there. So at lower voltage, the similar kind of behavior is happening here. If you increase a little bit of voltage, they are already uh, uh, like forming the filament much faster than the only potential itself. So these ions are also migrating faster. And when you apply light and voltage, you can see this filament is almost completed and they are almost, these ions are uh, moving much, much faster. So whole dynamics can be accelerated if you apply uh, light and voltage, both. So that is what, if you go back to this data again, you can see this under light, this, uh, the switching behavior is happening at even lower voltage than the higher voltage. Now, uh, this is another uh, aspect. Now, um, as I uh, told at the beginning, that we'll also discuss a little bit about the uh, nanocrystals, because these are also useful for memory devices. Uh, LEDs, uh, we have also uh, discussed the uh, uh, supercapacitors, this uh, nanocrystals can be used because whenever you go from say bulk crystals to nanocrystals, the surface area increases, a lot of uh, uh, photophysics change. So we uh, try to synthesize the uh, MA, CSPV BR3, this is inorganic uh, uh, allied periscites uh, by the LARP method, ligand assisted reprecipitation method. So basically, you add uh, CSBR, uh, lead bromide in DMF solution. You add like oleic olivine and oleic acid. So these are basically the uh, surfactant. So you need surfactant. Without surfactant, you cannot stabilize these uh, um, nanocrystals. So then we try to make three different types of nanocrystals. So when you make a fresh solution and try to make the nanocrystals, you get kind of a uh, single grain crystals. If it is like 15 days old uh, precursor, you try to uh, crystallize it. Uh, you get a, uh, nanocrystals which are having like multi facet. You can see like these are different colors, these are different facets. And if this uh, precursor solution is even much more uh, older, you get much more complicated structures here. So you have a lot of uh, different types of grain orientation. So we try to understand by uh, like. Uh, Structural analysis, we have uh, done some HRT and image analysis, and we realized that there are a lot of grains and grain boundaries in these devices. And that can affect the overall uh, uh, 
optical performance. Like this is the uh, the first sample where you have the uh, single pin uh, nanocrystals. So you have some sort of absorption. And uh, as you go on increasing the, uh, uh, the multigrain facet or multi facets, this PL actually goes to uh, uh, much lower. So this is around say 520 and this is almost like 540. So there is a sit in the peak position. At the same time, you can see the, uh, the excitonic peak also increases. So we believe that uh, the there are two types of uh, excitonic peak. One is the delocalized, much more delocalized peaks, and one is around the band age. So these two excitonic peaks are there, and that dynamics can be modulated by depending on the nature of the crystals, whether it's a small grain nanocrystals, single grain nanocrystals, or small grain angle nanocrystals or large grain angle nanocrystal. So optical properties can be tuned based on the structures. Now, what is the effect of the charge transport? So as I said, like in memory uh, devices, you need say hysteresis in these devices. Now, if you take nanocrystals, they, they show hysteresis somewhere close to the origin. Whereas if you take a polyxylene film, they show hysteresis somewhere away from the origin. And these two, two different types of uh, hysteresis can be uh, the resultant of the, what type of ionic transport you do have. Normally in single grain, you don't have only the uh, short range and migration because they are sort of uh, restricted. So there is no ion migration here. So there will be short range and migration. Whereas polycrystalline film, you have much longer range and migration. So ion will get stuck at the interfaces. So here, that's what the, uh, it, it, is, it is like a dipole. You, you make a dipole, so you get a P loop around the origin. But this is a different type of hysteresis which is coming at much higher voltage. But if you try to mix these together using a multigrain nanocrystals, you can have to some extent short range as well as long range ion migration, which can match these two behavior into the third one. So this is what these nanocrystals can manipulate a lot of different types of hysteresis effect. And that can be used in um, like memory effect, I mean, de depending on what type of nanocrystals we are choosing. Now, the last couple of minutes, I'll be just talking about the another application. This is, again, very upcoming field because these uh, halide periscates are uh, the mixed electronic and ionic uh, conductors. People are trying to uh, mimic neuron using these halide periscates where you have this, uh, this uh, synap synaptic uh, part can be modulated or can be uh, realized using this halide periscate actually between these two electrodes and uh, okay th this field is still upcoming but it's not uh, completely well understood yet a lot of uh, dynamics people are trying to understand how these uh, uh, halide periscate memory stars can be used in um, uh, this type of applications which are very upcoming uh, fields you know what we're competing there are some literature report, although like we have just started recently, we have, don't have yet any publication related to that. Uh, but this, this I feel like uh, the future of the halide periscites uh, to some extent. So you can see that uh, there is another, this paper actually talks about this neuromorphic computing using periscite uh, in uh, artificial neural network. They try to uh, uh, like uh, represent this image here. So recognize this image. So this is again upcoming field. We are also trying to do that. So to summarize this uh, last part, Halat Pesket has gained a lot of attention in memory applications because of the hysteresis you do see. And understanding hysteresis itself is a big deal. And if we are able to understand, we can um, understand the, uh, the, the switching mechanism very well. Short range and long range ion migration, as I have discussed uh, uh, just uh, now, that uh, that can manipulate the stresses in the uh, periscite uh, single crystal base or nanocrystal crystal base memory devices. Mixed electronic ionic uh, conduction in halide periscite could have a potential application in neuromorphic computing. And optical and electronic properties in halide uh, nanocrystals can be tuned by nature of grain movements. So with this, I'll uh, uh, close my talk and definitely uh, all this work done by uh, very good uh, and very exciting PhD students. Some of them already graduated. Some of them are uh, still doing it and funding and my collaborators. And thank you. So I'll, I'll be happy to answer whatever the questions you guys have. Thank you.
Thank you, sir, for sharing your knowledge with us. Now, quickly, we can take some questions from the participant. Uh, the first question is that which method is used for the synthesis of single crystal pregocyte material? So uh, we have used the inverse crystallization temperature. In the inverse temperature crystallization method. So you take a concentration, very high concentrated solution, and then uh, just uh, slow down the temperature, reduce the temperature, and slowly crystallize. So there are different methods we have used. In fact, like we have used direct powder synthesis. So you take a solution and inject the uh, in, into the uh, anti-solvent. You can get a uh, crystal instantly. But there will be very uh, tiny nanocrystals. The different way you can uh, synthesize. Yeah. The next question is, if we want to check only P or N-type individual characteristic, what is the expected result? So uh, uh, there are literature reports that both are highly mobile. Um, so if you look at the uh, theoretical value also, electron mobility and hole mobility both are high. Now, uh, inherently, uh, perovskites will behave either one type, not necessarily that both types we will see at the same time. It depends on the prehistoricity. As I said, like you, you apply some bias, you uh, select a different uh, electrode materials, you can uh, selectively make it either p-type or n-type, right? Unlike say silicon, where you do either p-type or n-type, it is always p-type or n-type. Here, the same material can be, as I, uh, as I have told, the same material can be either p-type or n-type, depending on the, the uh, condition you have. Right. So can you suggest some method to enhance the stability of crystal site? Yes, so um, uh, as I told, uh, there are few reports. So uh, the first criteria is you have to uh, minimize the ion migration, right? And uh, one of the reason you have a lot of ion migration is the defect states. So there are one strategy is to uh, passivate the defect states. So there are a lot of surface defect passivation techniques people have used like Lewis acid, Lewis based, or like you can even like uh, introduce uh, say uh, PCBM itself is a good uh, 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 surface passivator. You can introduce uh, the uh, little bit of additive to passivate the uh, ion migration. I, I have not talked about the uh, graphene quantum dot. People have, in fact, used graphene quantum dot uh, as a composite to reduce the ion migration. You can change the uh, dimensionality from, say, 3D to 2D. And finally, if you are able to make a very good quality single crystals for your device, like single crystal thin pin or single crystal based devices, there you expect your ion migration is much smaller and those devices are much more stable compared to the polycrystalline thing. If you just make a single crystal, keep it even outside, it will be stable for a long time. Unlike uh, the polycrystalline thing. Yeah. So for PCB, uh, where we need clean room or club box and in a simple lab we can done uh, Can I just uh, repeat it again? PLC pad, we need clean room or in a simple lab, we can bend it. Okay, please, uh, for the device fabrication, right? Yes. Um, for me, actually, the, the device uh, probably can make it even a uh, uh, glove box, but uh, the perovskite you can synthesize in uh, like controlled uh, humidity chamber because to synthesize perovskites, it is uh, like the moisture which actually creates a lot of defects. So you need a little bit of moisture to uh, create a good quality film, like say 22 to 22%. But if you have more than that, then it will be difficult. So uh, here actually, uh, I would say like the oxygen or maybe like uh, uh, environment does not have that strong effect compared to the uh, moisture. But at the same time, when you try to deposit say um, silver or gold or top electrode, your substrate or the device has to be very clean. That's for sure. Because otherwise what will happen is if there is a surface contamination, for example, like substrate, you clean it substrate, and then your surface is again contaminated by when you expose it to air. You'll not get the device. The perovskite can be uh, synthesized in open atmosphere, but your substrate and the other layer has to be deposited in a clean environment. 
Sorry? NMP is safe to use or is it friendly solvent, right? So, um, so it's always better to use in, uh, say, um, hood space. Normally, uh, in our lab, actually, we do it hood space with the gloves and with protective gears. Um, but OK. Uh, people have been talking about the toxicity effect, like lead is one which is definitely a toxic, right? So people have been talking about the lead-free perovskites, but unfortunately, their, their device is not that stable. So forget about the solvent. I mean, lead-based material itself is a toxic. So yeah, I mean, like DMF, DMS, so they are all toxic solvents. So that's uh, definitely you have to be very careful synthesize, when we are synthesizing, yes. Supercapacitors, mostly the power density is more, but the energy density or mass density is less. How do we improve these properties to use in place of normal batteries? Yes, so uh, that is where the concept of uh, the uh, hybrid supercapacitor come into the picture. So if you just talk about the uh, EDLC type, like electric double layer type capacitors, their energy density is not high. So then what you try to incorporate is kind of like battery type behavior, like the last part of my supercapacitor, I talked about the lithium ion intercalation, right? So that is nothing but kind of uh, the battery type. So when you try to mix EDLC plus battery type, sometimes people call it like supercapacitor, like you have supercapacitor and battery hybrid. Then you can optimize the power density as well as the uh, energy density both. Without pseudo capacitors, definitely will not get very high capacity. That's first. Thing. So you need to go to the hybrid supercapacitor. Thank you so much, sir. Once again, for giving yeah. your time and your knowledge. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Few questions can be addressed in the chat box later. Yes, yes. So I'll be there for some more time to if there is any questions I can answer. Okay. Uh, Dr. Mohanji, can you see me? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, hi. I'm in the here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, long time probably like 2000, uh, since 2008, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so yeah. Thank, thank you, thank you so for giving your time. Yeah, thank, thank you for calling also. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe we should catch up sometime later. Yes, sure, sure. Definitely, definitely. I'd love to come to Ardigar Gardens sometime. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Now we will take a short refreshment break and again start this meeting after 15 minutes. Kindly join us again at 12 15.
electronic participants, I hope you all are enjoying and learning something new from ILEP I2I online workshop. Now, I welcome Dr. Himanshu Gogoi, who will discuss and give tutorial on steps to record a website and then solar cell. Dr. Gogoi completed his PhD from IIT Guwahati and currently working in the fabrication and simulation of resistive random access memories. For a square demonstration, Mr. Abdul Basit, who is a PhD scholar from Tripoli Department of IIT Guwahati, will also be there. He is working on simulation and modeling of peroxide solar cells. Thank you, Sona. Uh, I'll share my screen. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes. And my screen is visible, I guess. Yeah. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, OK. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we are going to give the demonstration on this uh, solar, solar solar cell simulation software called SCAPS 1D. So this is the brief outline uh, of our demonstration today. First, we'll show the installation steps which we have already circulated over mail and uh, basic user interface. Then we'll simulate a simple PN junction and then some of the parameters will vary there. And then we'll move on to simulate a Roscat solar cell and then uh, We'll vary some other parameters and show how to optimize a uh, perovskite solar cell in in SCAPS. Then we'll do the similar uh, the same simulations using script file using script in SCAPS. And finally, we'll uh, simulate tandem solar cell using this uh, script. So these are the uh, basic installation steps. Uh, so I think already have received this mail. Uh, received these instructions over mail. And they have tried to they have tried to install it. So if you install it successfully, then you will uh, able to see this uh, user interface in front of you. Okay, so let's move to the uh, software. So in the software, we'll try to simulate a PN junction first. So for that, you go to your uh, C drive. So now after installation, this software will not create a shortcut. So you have to uh, open the open the software from the install folder. Yeah, so this is the uh, the basic user interface of the software SCAPS. So if you see here, there are certain sections uh, in the to top left corner. Uh, you see there is a working point. So that sets the that sets the temperature of your simulation, then the uh, then the voltage and the frequency, which will be used uh, for basically. This is actually basically used for uh, this capacitance frequency uh, simulations, not for IV. So these are the like operating point uh, and these are some series and shunt resistance that you can use along with your solar cell. And then in this in the, in this middle section, you, you can see you can uh, you can use that the different uh, solar spectrum for uh, simulation of the solar cell. And, and below that, you, you can see there are different uh, simulation options like IV, CV, CF, QE. So we'll go through these options one by one during the uh, during the demonstration uh, with the help of different examples. So these are some of the parameters of this uh, simulations type. And if you uh, and if you want to create a new structure, you have to go to the set problem. OK, so here. This is the uh, panel to create a new structure in this panel. You have to add a, uh, You have to click add layer. I hope everyone is uh, like able to follow me. If I'm going to first, then you can uh, stop me and ask me to repeat. OK, so. So here we are going to create a uh, PN, PN junction solar cell. So basically it, this uh, structure is very simple. A uh, P type silicon, uh, P type silicon and N type silicon. So first I will add a layer, which is a silicon. Uh, so in the in the along with the software, there are some predefined like predefined 
default material list is coming, so we can in include those. Yeah, you can load those material from this uh, load material uh, option. So here is the list of all the uh, materials that is available uh, in the sketch. So for this first example, we will use the default material. Uh, in the later examples, we will try, we will show how to how to ma make a new material uh, file in the in this software. So we are taking this silicon, we are loading it. So we are uh, we are not changing any anything. We are just using the default settings over here. Okay. So we will give this as as p silicon. Hello. Yeah. Participant, some participants saying that they need some repeat. Can you go back? Okay, okay, sure, sure. I'll go slow. So let me come back one step. Uh, let me go one step back. Uh, in fact, I'll I'll start from the first window. So now I'm going to create a new uh, new structure, which is a uh, simple PN junction, uh, the basic structure so to create a new structure you have to go to this set problem so this is the window to create a new uh, structure so here you can see you can add different layers here so in scapes you can add up to seven layers so to add a new layer you click here so another uh, window will pop up where you can add the properties of the material that you want to use so these are the, all the properties but for this first example I'm not going to uh, like change any this any of these parameters. I'm going to directly load uh, some pre like pre-installed material like pre previously saved material, which is silicon. I'm loading it, so I'm not changing any parameter. I'm using it by default like whatever parameter is there, but I need to change the doping concentration because uh, it need uh, I need it to be P type. So I'll change the concentration of this any and reduce like this to very small value. And also I need to uh, change the thickness. I'll, okay, for this example, let's take uh, two micron, two micron only, and I'll change the name of this layer, which is P silicon. So I'm not changing any other parameter. So I'll just add it. So if you see in this uh, part here, so that uh, P silicon is added. So now I'm going to add the second layer, which is the n-type n-type silicon. So again, I'm going to click add, and I'm going to load material. Same silicon, but I'll just change the doping type. I'm I'll going to make it uh, n-type. So load, same procedure. So here I'll just change the name. This is N silicon and uh, thickness I will make it, let's say uh, 0.5 micron this time. Uh, okay, And uh, not changing any of this parameter. I'll just change this thing to make it N type. Okay. So, so if you see here, uh, so this is the PN junction. So red, the red part is the P type, which is a uh, comparatively thicker, thicker, and uh, blue is the N type. So this is the direction from where light is being illuminated. So I can change this direction from here. So if I want to illuminate from P side, then I can change it like this. So, and again, we can change the uh, direct, uh, terminal where to apply voltage by changing this. Okay. okay. Okay, so uh, coming back to the contact. So uh, this this structure, the left contact is the one connected to the P side. So I'll click click this, so I can change the uh, uh, properties of the contact. So either if you want to use a specific material, uh, sorry, specific metal, so you can enable this and you can input the work function of that particular metal. For suppose if you uh, want to use aluminium, so I'll directly input uh, 4.1 or 4.2. Okay, for the time being, I'm not changing. Uh, I'm not uh, using any specific metal work function. I'm just using uh, the default and uh, default parameters like this. Uh, just harmonic emission values. Okay, similarly from right contact. These values are there. I'm not changing. So if I want to change, I'll, I can just change this metal work function here. 
So this structure is ready for simulation. This is a very basic structure. We'll uh, show some uh, uh, advanced structure in the subsequent examples. OK, and these are the numerical settings that are, that are being used to do the simulation. So if by changing these parameters, like all parameters has uh, certain meaning and certain significance. So if time allows time parameters, we, at the end we will go through some of these parameters. But for the time being, we are, we are using the default, par default, uh, those default parameters. OK, so we are coming back to the previous. Window. OK, so here. So first we want to see the dark IV of the of the PN junction that we have just created. So for that we need to enable the IV. We need to set a range. Suppose we are, we are, we are doing it from 0 to 1.5. And this is the step size. So let's make it 0 0.01. So, so this is the voltage range we are applying. So, yeah, so by really this should come. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, we are doing, uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, we were doing it in the dark. So voltage range is from 0 to 1.5 and the step size is uh, 0 0.01. OK, so to run it, you have to click calculate single shot. So it is being simulated. It's, it's fine. Actually, we have taken a uh, larger range, uh, but simulation is completed. Um, so here in the top right, in the top left corner, you can see the band diagram. So you can get the band diagram uh, at every at all the voltage values that we have tried. This is the this is the band diagram at the final final voltage that we have simulated, and this is the uh, concentration of the charge carrier. So if you click the IV, so you will get the IV of the of the PN junction in the dark. So. Uh, if you if you click on show, so you'll get all the data points uh, from from this IV, and you can export these data points uh, and plot it in maybe in some origin or MATLAB, whatever software you are comfortable with. So to export it, you have to go to save and save it using some uh, some name data IV one so something any any name. So you can save it. So later on that file you can use it in any uh, graph plotting software. OK. Uh, and coming back to this uh, main window, so this time we are going to uh, do uh, the same simulation, this IV sweep in the in the presence of light. So to en enable the light, so you have to click it here. And then in, in this option here, you can select different uh, light spectrum. So in this in the software, it, the software comes with a different uh, this light spectrum files. So uh, we are we are going to use for this simulation. We are going to use this uh, AM 1.5 Z, which is commonly used for solar cell simulation or for solar cell. OK, so I have selected dark. So. From 0 to 1.5, I will enable this this. Uh, I'll do the simulation only up to VOC. Actually, if we if we do the simulation for a larger range, so what happens is that there is some convergence uh, error uh, comes up. So we'll stop the simulation only uh, at the open circuit voltage (VOC). So same just before going for the simulation, we will just clear the previous simulation, clear all simulations, and again go for calculate single shot. Yeah, the simulation is done. So if we go for IV now, uh, this is the IV, and uh, that, and this is the VOC ASC value that we are getting, uh, and this is the field factor, and this is the efficiency. So uh, for this simulation, actually, we have not uh, varied any parameter. We just used whatever default parameter was there. That's why this efficiency, efficiency, the VOC, these values are coming very less. So you can. Uh, optimize those parameters. Uh, you can take the take those values uh, the from from research, research papers and improve this efficiency. 
Okay. So, for example, uh, you, uh, we have already uh, created a problem like the structure beforehand. So we'll load load that program and run it for you just to show like you know, how to how you will we'll get a better results from this same device. So for that we can go for load. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, so uh, I think there is a video delay for some of the participants. So whenever, whatever you're changing on your screen, maybe you can go a little slow. OK, OK, sir, yeah. OK, so uh, if we go back to the set problem window, so whatever we have created, we can save it. Like just we need to click save. So we can give any name, whatever, like. Simple PN junction. And it will be saved in the scarce folder as a dot definition file. So these definition files can be used at some later point of time. OK. And uh, we can load previously previously saved files. So uh, just to show like. Uh, I'll load a previously simulated uh, file, so simple PN that we have named it earlier. So if we simulate this, so we are going uh, for a IV sweep in the in the presence of light. We are going to clear the previous simulations by clear all simulations and do calculate single shot. OK, so simulation is done. If we go to IV, you see this the significant improvement in the uh, parameters. You can see the efficiency is now 21 because in this file uh, we have used the parameters which are like optimized, uh, which are optimized for this um, structure. So how to, how to uh, do these optimizations that those uh, those things we will see in the uh, subsequent examples, maybe uh, where, while we are doing where, well when we are going to do this pair of sketch simulation. OK. So I think uh, in, uh, apart from IV, this capacitance voltage, capacitance frequency and QE uh, simulations we can do, uh, but I don't think uh, we'll be able to manage time for that. If we are able to manage time, we will go to uh, so we'll show some uh, some uh, simulations for this this type of sim this type of simulations at the end. So next we are going to do do a simulation. We are going to simulate a perovskite structure. So for that, uh, Mr. Abdul Basit will uh, help me. Good afternoon, everyone. So we will uh, we will now simulate a perovskite solar cell. Uh, we will be simulating this perovskite solar cell structure where P dot PSS and PCBM are used as transport layers. And since uh, these materials are not uh, present in the inbuilt library of uh, SCAP, so we would be needing to make the material file of these materials uh, in, uh, manually. And uh, we will be using these parameters uh, to make these material files. All these uh, material parameters are taken from the literature. So. In order to start, we start with a new simulation and uh, we will add all the layers one by one. Uh, let's start by adding uh, P dot PSS. So first we will uh, to change the thickness. Uh, we'll add some. Predefined thickness and uh, from the uh, literature we can get, get the these parameters, for example, uh, the band gap is 2.9 electron volts. Electron affinity is 2.4. Dielectric permittivity is 6.5. Similarly, you can change all these uh, conduction band. and the electron and hole mobility. The speed dot is uh, its whole transport layer, so we'd be using uh, 
acceptor doping of tennis for 18, which is widely uh, available in the literature. And also radiative recombination uh, coefficient will be adding, which is also which also we are getting from the literature. And OJ recombination coefficient. So uh, this is the P dot layer which you uh, can manually enter these uh, parameters to make a new material and you can save this material for uh, future use uh, so that you can uh, load it directly to your structure. You can save it here to your material directory. You can use it later on also. So similarly, uh, we can add uh, all other layers one by one since uh, there is not much time. So we can we have already made the uh, para these uh, material files for perovskite and PCBM. So we'll be loading them directly from the directory. They are not. They won't be available in the uh, scaps directly. We have made them before. So that's why they are available there. So you will have to make them uh, one by one manually. Similarly, we will add one uh, electron transport layer. Which is PCBM. And uh, at last we'll be setting the contacts. So since uh, on uh, a node side we'll be using a node side we'll be using uh, this ito which has a work function of 5.0 and on cathode side we'll be using aluminium you can set all these uh, work functions here right contact and left contact and finally, we will we have to decide from where we uh, shine the light since uh, we are using ITO on P dot side, which uh, is transparent. So we would like to shine the light on P dot side, which is on left. So we'll eliminate it from left. And uh, our our um, structure is ready. You can save the structure for later use also. And um, once our structure is ready, uh, we'll be um, now uh, simulating it first we'll simulate it in dark and uh, check uh, IV characteristics in dark. So this is the dark IV which you can uh, check from the simulations and also you can check the energy bands. Uh, this energy band is at uh, at the final voltage you can if you want to check the energy bands at uh, equilibrium you can simply uh, uh, give the final voltage as zero volts and uh, calculate so this will be the equilibrium energy bands similarly uh, you can check the uh, electric carrier densities as well as uh, the generation recombination uh, profiles they will be visible OK, so to simulate this same structure in uh, light, we'll be turning on the light and. Uh, and we'll calculate the will uh, simulate it again in the presence of light. So as you can see, the uh, you can check the solar cell parameters from here. IV, it uh, you can get the efficiency, fill factor, uh, short circuit current, and VOC from here. Now, uh, if you want to, if you want to check these solar cell parameters for different uh, thicknesses or different other parameters, 
whichever parameter you want to change. You can do that from batch setup. There is one option here in batch setup where you can add any parameter you want to vary. For example, if you want to vary the thickness of uh, perovskite, uh, and uh, if you want to vary the thickness of perovskite, you have just just have to set the range uh, range uh, in which you want to vary and the step size. For example, if we want to vary from uh, 0.1 micron to uh, 2 micron with, let's say, 10 steps, we can do that uh, in the presence of light. And uh, we, we have to calculate, uh, after setting up this, uh, the batch program, we can uh, simulate it for all the, all the thicknesses. It will simulate it one by one. So simulation for all thicknesses is complete. Then you can check in IV. This is for uh, different thicknesses. You can check uh, by right clicking the plot. You can uh, you can decide, you can check which uh, IV belongs to which thickness. For example, the initial thickness was 0 0.5. So 0. Point, uh, and similarly other thicknesses. And you can check their parameters one by one by selecting here, for example, 0 0.5 uh, for uh, one micron, we are getting efficiency of 12. Similarly, for uh, 0 0.3 micron or the thickness, whichever um, you can calculate those thicknesses using those uh, the range and uh, range and uh, that step size. So you can check one by one the solar cell parameters uh, for all the thicknesses but if you want to check on a, in a single plot like you want to plot uh, efficiency with respect to thickness or any other solar cell parameter with respect to thickness for that you have to uh, click on the recorder setup there is one option recorder setup here and in a recorder setup you can uh, you can select whatever uh, parameter you want to uh, plot with the uh, plot with the thickness. For example, here, let's say we want to plot efficiency, then we insert it. Similarly, we want to plot uh, short circuit current also, we add it, then VOC and similarly fill factor for example we want to plot these four quantities with respect to thickness so we add them here in the recorder setup and after that uh, we uh, simulated again this time we uh, press click the uh, record calculate recorder so that it will uh, simulate all these uh, all uh, the perovskite solar cell for all these thicknesses again but it will also record the thickness and it will record all these quantities with respect to thickness and plot it. So all these structures are simulated. Again, we can check the IV here, which is similar, but at this, uh, but we can also uh, check the the we can check the plot of these quantities with respect to thickness. For example, this is short circuit current with respect to thickness, which is increasing, which is obvious because uh, higher, thicker the perovskite layer, more there will be absorption. And similarly, uh, we can check other quantities like VOC with respect to thickness or uh, this uh, solar cell efficiency with respect to thickness. As we can see, it is increasing indefinitely, indefinitely. As we increase the thickness, the efficiency is increasing. But in practical cases, 
uh, in practical cases, this there will be some optimum thickness where uh, where the thick where the this efficiency will be maximum because in practical cases uh, they. <coughs> The diffusion length of free carriers, which it is finite, uh, due to which uh, we cannot go for higher th thicknesses. So, if you want to, for example, in practical uh, cases, we will have uh, will have defects in uh, the perovskite material. We can add the defects here if you want to make it more practical. This simulation, we can add the defects. By going into the by going into the material file of this uh, perovskite, we can click add defect, and then uh, we can uh, add the defect characteristics. Like let's suppose it is a it is an accepted defect uh, with uh, capture cross section cross section of 10 raised per minus 14, which is uh, available on the literature in the literature, and uh, Let's suppose that it is a discrete defect. You, you can also assume we can add uh, other uh, defects like which have uh, Gaussian distribution or un uniform distribution or exponential dif distribution. Let's suppose it is uh, a discrete defect with, uh, let's suppose it is uh, 0.2 electron volts from uh, below conduction band which is shallow defect and let's suppose it is uh, its density is you can change the density here. Let's suppose it is 10 is for 17 centimeter per cube. So here you can add the defect and it is uh, it gets added to the perovskite layer. Then you can simulate it again uh, in the presence of defect. For example, you can. Again, uh, the batch setup and record setup is already set up before, so you can simulate it again for uh, in the presence of defect. Let's see uh, which thickness is the most optimized thickness for for uh, maximum efficiency. So now, as you can see, in presence of defect, the uh, the short circuit current does not increase indefinitely. So there is one thickness where it starts decreasing because of uh, due to in the presence of defect, the diffusion length is reduced. So uh, we <coughs> up to certain uh, thickness, the light absorption will increase. But after that, light absorption will still increase. But uh, the due to uh, finite diffusion length, it will uh, the carriers will the generated electron hole pairs will recombine and will not be collected efficiently. So from this, uh, you can see also efficiency. From this, we can see the uh, efficiency is maximum at uh, 0 0.5 microns. So uh, we we can use 0 0.5 micron uh, thick perovskite layer. So that is how you uh, can optimize. Uh, different parameters in you can optimize different parameters in uh, this uh, scaps like we have optimized the thickness so we can use the optimized thickness uh, and similarly then you can uh, optimize the thickness of one by uh, all the layers one by one which i am not going to do here because of the time limitation so the optimized so the, we can check for results for the uh, we can check result for the optimized uh, thickness once again to see if there is improvement in the efficiency. As we can see. Uh, just a minute. 0 0.5. OK, actually in the presence of traps, the efficiency is reduced, but we get a thickness where there is a maximum efficiency of 17, uh, which is maximum efficiency of 17 percent, uh, which is for 0 0.5 microns. Similarly, we can optimize the thickness of other layers also. And uh, 
also one more thing you can do is for, you can vary two parameters at a time. For example, uh, you can add one more parameter uh, like you can. You can vary temperature. You can vary uh, all these parameters which you can check on the software. Uh, what are the parameters that you can vary? For example, let's vary the defect density. Uh, from uh, let's use two defect densities. One is low defect density. And high defect density. And again, you simulate uh, these parameters. So now, as you can see, uh, for this is for defect density of 10 raised power minus 10 raised power 15, and this is 10 raised power 17. As you can see, they with increasing defect defects uh, density, the thickness at which uh, there is the thickness at which there is maximum efficiency it decreases, which is obvious because with higher def defect density, there will be a uh, smaller uh, diffusion length. So we will need to use, uh, we'll use, use thinner uh, perskite layers. So, so that's how you can uh, vary all the parameters and optimize them. Next, uh, next will be, next we'll be simulating the, uh, the tandem solar cell, which will be taken over by Imangshu. Okay. Okay. Coming back to uh, this presentation yeah so uh, whatever we have seen uh, like the different uh, simulation that we have done using this user interface uh, in the in the scaps uh, for that we need to click as uh, like suppose we want to do iv then we have to click here we need to set certain range and then we have to uh, go do this uh, single shot then we have to go to the iv then we have to extract these parameters so there's a lot of uh, like manual clickings uh, clickings are involved and so in and if we want to do some simulations where uh, suppose we need to do IV and CV simultaneously or uh, in, in a sequence or something like that. So those things are not very uh, flexible by using this user interface. So for those part, uh, for those uh, uh, cases, so we can use the uh, script setup to write some uh, write the same steps in the form of code and do the simulations. So in this way, it is more flexible to do any uh, any simulations. So to start with, uh, I'll show um, well, how to write a script for just to sim just to simulate a simple structure like the, uh, maybe whatever we have uh, simulated so far just now. So to access that script file, uh, uh, script setup. So you have to click here, script setup. So this script editor panel will pop up. So here you have to write uh, this uh, this code. So the this code there, like if we go go back to this presentation, yeah, any script command. So it, it is in the form of like this command argument and value. So this uh, these commands are the here you can see this these are the list of uh, uh, command that is uh, that can be used in in scaps, and this argument can be a variable or can be uh, can be any file name. 
So these are the some examples of the variable. So where all the M and you can M uh, in the M you can use any letter from A to Z. So for example, this and these are some examples of the these variables, uh, this script variables. So although these uh, commands are very limited, when you combine these commands with these uh, variables and arguments, so there is a huge list of uh, commands possible in scaps. So remembering all these commands is not possible for a normal user. So you can refer to the scaps manual where all the commands are written and their use case and their de definitions are uh, given. So for example, we will use some of these uh, commands. So and we'll try to understand what is the meaning of those commands. So I'll go back to the scaps. Yeah, this is the scaps editor window. So here uh, we need to write. I think rather than writing the, the code, I will load uh, a previously written code and I, we will go to the commands one by one, line by line, one by one. So I load. So we have written. Uh, so if I load, so the script folder will open. So in the script, so like. So I'm just loading on script. So here, if uh, if we go line by line by line, so first is clear all. We should clear all the previously uh, previously uh, previously saved uh, variable values. So we'll uh, then uh, this clear action is the all. Uh, we'll clear all the previously saved actions. And uh, this action light is equivalent to turning on this dark and light button uh, in the in this home panel. And this action IV light this command is uh, it sets the what is the start uh, start uh, start value of the voltage sweep that we are going to do. So basically, it is equivalent to uh, like the this IV setting it to zero value. So action IV dot stop V is uh, 2.2. It is same. What is the stop voltage for this simulation? And we are setting an action IV dot increment zero. 0 0.01 is equivalent to this in uh, the setting the step size. So this then again action IV check action is uh, basically the equivalent to clicking this IV option IV. Then these are the commands to set this IV simulation type like what is the range of the simulation that we are going to do? What is the type of simulation? Then we will we need to load the file which we want to simulate. So this file and the, the structure you have to design in this in this main user interface only, but you can call those previously saved design, uh, previously saved design in the in the script, and you can simulate it. So, for example, here we are calling load definition file uh, simple pn. So we have previously, if you remember, we have uh, run we have run a program called uh, simple uh, pn. So simple pn dot df. So we are loading that file, and we are calculating single shot. We are calculating single shot. So basically, this calculating single shot here. And we are writing get IV. So get IV is that like and this I and V value of the simulation will be stored in these two variables, which is V and W. And these are the commands to get the uh, VOC, ZSC, fill factor, eta. So like mat, mat dot characteristics VOC, A, A, VW. So this VW for, from this VW, which is this VW, and uh, it, the VOC will be calculated and it will be stored in variable A. Similarly, uh, like this ZSC will be stored in B and a fill factor will be stored in C and uh, efficiency eta will be stored in D. So if we write this write this uh, script and we save, uh, we click OK. So now script is ready. So what we'll do, we'll go, we need to do execute script to run this program, run, run this script. So now this, uh, this is giving the giving us the voltage and the current density values here. And if we click here, it will give us the IV. Which is the same as uh, the uh, one we have simulated using the user interface. And also I think if we uh, if we go back, if we do. Uh, it is also giving us uh, this value of uh, ZSC, uh, so VOC ZSC and the fill factor and the efficiency. So uh, as we have saved it in the value uh, in the variable A, B, C, D, so it is writing as A value, B value, C value, D value. So we can rename these uh, variables and write properly uh, like uh, VOC, ASC, fill factor like that. 
OK, so we can uh, simulate the same uh, the same simulations that we have seen earlier using this script also. So for uh, to uh, simulate the tandem solar cell, we need to use this script script file format. So for that. So there are actually uh, to simulate a tandem solar cell, uh, I guess like uh, uh, you, we are we all know about this tandem solar cell here. There are two cells, uh, two uh, series connected solar cells, one having a uh, wider band gap, one having a narrow band gap. So like it is basically uh, like. Like this, uh, two, two cells, so uh, there are two strategies to like uh, simulate a tandem solar cell. In the first strategy, what you need to do, uh, you need to separate the top cell and the bottom cell separately in the uh, in the design. In the set problem um, panel. So then you have to you have to save those two files uh, separately with some separate name in the scaps.def folder. And then I'm just going through the, these lines. Then we'll see in in, in the uh, in the software. Then we have to write the code to uh, to uh, then uh, to combine these two uh, sub cell into one and get the IV of it. So, so let's go to the software. We'll clear all the simulations, previous simulations. First, first step is we need to design the top cell and the bottom cell separately. So for that, you need to go to set problem, and and suppose uh, uh, we want to we want to simulate a structure like a silicon solar solar cell and a perovskite solar cell. Let's take the example of uh, the two solar cells that we have simulated. First, uh, the first one silicon solar cell we have uh, simulated and the perovskite solar cell Basit has shown. Basit has shown. We will combine those two solar cells in the form of a tandem cell. Okay. So for that, we'll uh, we we have already saved those two files. So one is the uh, the simple PN that we, we just simulated using the script, and the other one is uh, yeah. So this is the structure. Uh, this we have seen uh, the Perovskite uh, cell just we have seen just a while ago, and the other one is the PN junction cell that we have seen at, at the beginning. So we are going to combine these two files. These two files are already already saved there in this in this definition file, in this definition folder of the scaps folder. You can see, if you can see it, you will find it here. So as it is already uh, already created and saved, we are not doing this step. So we are sk skipping step number one and two. So that is defining uh, the top cell and the bottom cell. Then we will go to script and we will load a new script. OK, so uh, I'm not writing it. I'm, I'll just go through the lines quickly. So writing will take some uh, more time. So this initial steps are same. Clear all actions like setting the range of the uh, IV sweep, and uh, we stop after stop after VOC. So this here comes the first. So in this command, uh, in this in, in this section, we are trying to load the uh, top cell, which is the perovskite cell. And so for that, we are writing load definition file so we need to write the name of the file so we as we have written the file name like as a long one so like this so we have to write the entire name as it is dot def so then we have to do a uh, sim separate single shot of that one and whatever iv we uh, we will get we will we are going to save it in uh, in a variable uh, the I, the current will be saved in z variable and voltage will be saved in u variable similarly the we will load the bottom cell which is like simple pn uh, one like maybe any different yeah so we are doing a single sort of that structure this is basically this uh, simple pn junction and we are saving this iv in a, in in some uh, in two different two different variables which are v and w then comes the command which connects the two two sub cells into one which is math series uh, math series that math series connects uh, the two sub two sub cell like if you see this x y 
ZU and VW. So ZU was the voltage and the uh, current of the top cell and VW was the voltage and the current of the sec uh, bottom cell. So these two will be uh, series connected and they will be saved in XY.